Hey, everybody. Welcome to the weekend, and it's time for another Word Balloon podcast. John Suntress here, a great double feature for you today. We're going to talk to Ted Anderson, who's one of the big Aftershock Comics creators. He just created uh, Moth and Whisper, which is a new book. It comes out next week. First issue, great story, interesting caper story, kind of a cyberpunk story. He talks about that and a very interesting lead character that we'll go into detail as well. That's what starts off on today's Word Balloon. Then we talk to Brad Meltzer. Brad is back. I am Neil Armstrong, a new collaboration with him and Chris Iliopoulos, the wonderful children's collection of biographies that kids uh, can really appreciate, but adults can too. Brad and Chris always find fun facts about these people, and it's a great story about Neil Armstrong. I am a huge Nash a freak, so obviously Brad and I talk about that. We also get into his short story that he provided for Action 1000, and a lot of comic book talk as well. It's great to have Brad Meltzer back. Great to welcome Ted Anderson here on Word Balloon. This episode of Word Balloon is sponsored by Aftershock Comics, shaking things up at your local comic store right now. With hit series like Animosity by Marguerite Bennett and Raphael De La Tour, Baby Teeth with Donny Cates and Gary Brown, and A Walk Through Hell from Garth Ennis and Goran Suzuka, as well as exciting new titles like Hot Lunch Special from Elliot Rial and George Forez, Beyonders with Paul Jenkins and Wesley St. Clair, and today's focus on Moth and Whisper from Ted Anderson and Jen Hickman. Check out what's rumbling at Aftershock.com. Word Balloon is also brought to you by the League of Word Balloon listeners. Thank you, League, for your support via Patreon. I appreciate the subscriptions. It's the beginning of a new month. Thank you very much for your continued support. It makes it easier to get to the conventions and make the connections of these brand new guests that we are able to bring you each month here at Word Balloon. I think uh, what I do here at Word Balloon is uh, different than a lot of other comic book com- uh, podcasters out there, and I'm sure you agree. Uh, is it worth the price of a comic book each month? Is it worth a dollar each month? If you can spare it and subscribe to Word Balloon, you're really helping out uh, keeping things going here at Word Balloon. It's free. Word Balloon will always be free. I promise you that. But if you'd like to help out the cause and think what I'm doing here is worth your while, a subscription via Patreon would be greatly appreciated. As a thank you, you're getting advanced listens to a lot of these Terrificon panels. I am happy to do that for you. Uh, right now, uh, advanced listening on the 80th anniversary of Superman panel featuring Roger Stern, Jerry Ordway, Pete Tomasi, Paul Kupperberg. Unbelievable stuff. Uh, and also the 80th anniversary of Robin the Boar Wonder, because we're almost at that point now. That'll be in 2019. But Mike Barr, Denny O'Neill, Tim Seeley, uh, Pete Tomasi, among the creators that are discussing Robin the Boy Wonder. A great discussion in both cases. A real pleasure doing all these terrific con panels. Again, go to patreon.com slash word balloon or click on the Patreon ad to become part of the League of Word Balloon listeners. All right, let's get into it. Our first conversation with Ted Anderson. Uh, he's got a great uh, catalog of work. We talk about some work that he's done on licensed books as well. And I can't help it, man. We, I get into a Star Trek Discovery rant. I'm telling you, I'm toxic when it comes to that show. I am rooting for the second season, as I say as well. But uh, happy to welcome Ted Anderson on today's Word Balloon. Ted Anderson, welcome to Word Balloon. And uh, congratulations on uh, the first issue of Moth and Whisper. Thank you very much. Uh, great to be here. Thank you, John. Um, it's a real honor. I've been listening to you for years now. Uh, I mean, ah, geez, yeah. I've been listening to you back since back in like 2007, I want to say. Wow. All right. There yeah. you go. Well, in waves. I mean, I had to. Uh, oh, please. I, I, you know, I step off every now and then. But oh, yeah. No, every listening. week, Ted, it, or it doesn't yeah, count. <laughs> it doesn't count. No, I'm not a real fan. Yeah. No. <laughs> No, doesn't. not at all. Man. I was just telling you off the air. I pick and choose with my uh, with my podcasts, and it's like, yeah, I don't, I'm not really interested in that guest. I'll skip this week. That's fine. <laughs> so please, man. No, that's great, man. That's that's close to the beginning. Twenty two thousand five was my beginning. Okay, yeah, but yeah, no, that's a long time, and I I really appreciate it. So thank you. Yeah. And um, so tell me your uh, comic book origin. Uh, how how did you arrive to uh, doing this aftershock book? Oh boy. Okay, so um, I am. So I, I broke into the business as a writer. I still, I mean, I'm just a well, not just a writer, but I still am. I'm a writer primarily. I can't illustrate to the degree that I want to see it on the page, which makes it harder in a lot of ways to pitch books, obviously, because it's you know you can't show a, a page to people at a con and have them immediately recognize quality or you know lack thereof. I hear you, man. Yeah. So I, I, I you know, I grew up. I, wrote, I grew up writing pitch. I grew up, but I mean, I wrote pitches all through college. I looked around. I went to cons. I showed things to people. Um, I just eventually what what it came down to was one of those lucky 
breaks. I mean, I forget who said it, but like breaking into creative industry, any creative industry is like breaking out of prison yes. where the, the first time one guy figures out how to do it. Yeah. Then then nobody else can do that same way. Yeah. They wall up the escape hatch. And yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, exactly. yeah. Square one again. Absolutely. Yeah, so it is. It was. It was one of those fortuitous combinations of of luck and networking and knowing the right people and just being in the right place at the right time. So, um, I'm in Minneapolis, and there's a decent there's a decent crowd of cartoonists in Minneapolis. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, in particular, it's it's partly it's because there's the Minneapolis College of Art and Design, which is one of the few colleges that I think has a, a comics like illustration, a comics illustration major. Oh, cool. So there's a lot of yeah, there's a lot of cartoonists who kind of hang around town, both you know like web cartoonist type people, professionals have been around, you know all sorts all sorts of folks. And um, one of the people that I I'm close to in town is Xander Cannon, who's he's currently doing Kaiju Max for Oni yes, Press. Indeed, love that guy. He just came up in conversation with uh, Brad Meltzer. And oh. we we're talking about great books, and Kaiju Max absolutely came up. I love Xander, good dude. Oh yeah, he is, and he is a he is a wonderful guy in person too. He yep. is a he is a true guy, and we just you know we started hanging out. We have very similar outlooks on life, on on creating and all that stuff. And he also has been in the business for something like twenty five years now. Oh so yeah, he, absolutely. Yeah. Him and Alan Moore are uh, top ten. He and Alan Moore and Gene Ha, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So he's worked with everyone. He's worked in everything. He's been writing. He's done layouts. He's done lettering, penciling, inking. So he has he has worked for everyone and everything. Mm-hmm. Um, and the other half of of my lucky origin story was, uh, as I'm sure you're well aware, the television show My Little Pony: Friendship Is Magic. Um, <laughs> I'm sure. I mean, I'm sure that everybody listening to this is a fan of that show and knows exactly. Absolutely. Hey, man. <laughs> No, much like hey, much like Rocky and Bowwinkle, there's something going on beyond the surface. Yeah, and, and honestly, I I will I wouldn't say I'm a brony per se, but I do have a lot of friends that work on the books, and also really admire the fact that, and I forget her name, the original Lauren. showrunner that really kind of, you know, turned the corner on My Little Pony and said, you know, we can have a lot more fun with this if we try. Oh yeah, Lauren Faust. The, there we the, go. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, man. Yeah, so yeah, great, ad- great admiration for uh, friendship is magic. Absolutely, <laughs> right, well, excellent, excellent. Yeah, yeah. I, I've gotten, I've gotten inured to it to the point where I kind of have to almost start off with an apology about it. You know, Not I feel a little bit. Yeah. Well, it's also <laughs> it's, there's also a fandom element to that where to, by this point it's, yeah, I'm a little scared about telling people about that. But it, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, but yeah, I got into the show from a relatively early point. Um, I thought it was great. I thought it was a lot of fun. I thought it was smart. I thought it was, uh, you know, it was a well done show for kids yeah. that wasn't embarrassing, or it wasn't embarrassed about being for kids, which I think is crucial for kids media. Agreed. Yeah, and I realized somewhere along the way, hey, they're going to make a comic series out of this. I should figure out who's going to do it and see if I can get my my hooks in early. Um, I dug around. I figured it would either be Boom or IDW because Boom had all the Cartoon Net uh, Cartoon Network stuff currently, mm-hmm. and then. Um, IDW, of course, had all the Hasbro stuff. Uh, right. It was IDW. I talked to Xander, and of course, Xander has worked for IDW, obviously. So he's he put me in touch with someone there. He put me in touch with the editor. I sent up some samples. They said, "Hey, this is pretty good." Hey, sent us some pitches, and I sent up some pitches. And they sent those on the Hasbro, and then yeah, I started off writing for one of the biggest licensed books of the time. That's um, outstanding. Who was your artist <laughs> on uh, My Little Pony? Oh, it was. I mean, it was a ro- it's a rotating crew. It still is a rotating crew. The first guy was this guy Ben Bates, who's um, he's kind of well, he hasn't totally left comics. I know he's got something coming out for Image soon, but he's doing a lot of storyboard cartoon stuff. He's actually working on um, uh, series OKKO OK right now. That's okay. Getting, mm-hmm. Yeah, he's he's he was phenomenally talented. I was super happy to get. I worked with him on three, maybe four issues. I'm trying to remember. Um, but yeah, I mean, everyone who's I've worked with on that on that crew. I mean, there's Andy Price and there's Agnes yes. Garbasca. There's yes. Um, have you worked with Katie yet? Katie Cook? I have not. Well, yeah, that's the thing. Katie doesn't illustrate. Like she's illustrated oh, a couple of the short writing. comics. Yeah. I didn't realize that. Of course. Oh, you're right. Yeah. And of course. So she's writing. So, yeah, you wouldn't be. How about Tony Fleece, my buddy Tony? Oh, yeah. You know, I've worked with Tony a bunch of times. Um, I love Tony. Jay Fosgett. Jay Fosgett is amazing. Sure. Yeah, excellent. Really absolutely. Have absolutely. Have yeah. But, so. yeah, there's a, it's a really good rotating crew of people. Um, and, of course, I would be remiss if I missed Heather, Heather Breckel, the colorist, and all of them. Very cool. fantastic, Fantastic colors as well. Yeah. And it's it's been – God, it's been like – Five years now, I've been working on that book. <laughs> I'm just awesome. I'm realizing it. Um, and I've done someone someone did a flow chart or a, a, a number chart a little while ago where they figured out I have written the second most out of or like the second most writing credits on the on all the pony books put together behind uh, Jeremy Whitley because of course Jeremy Whitley, you know, he turns around and he finishes the script. So I'm hip. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, but so yeah, so I uh, I've been on that book for a long time. It's been a it's been a heck of a lot of fun. Um, licensed books are always it, it, licensed books have been a lot of fun because of course you don't have to waste a lot of time setting things up. You can kind of just dive in sure. and play with the toys. Um, yeah, and through that through that working with my editor Bobby Kernow on all those. Yes, indeed. I've been, yeah. Oh, and he I mean he handles his own stuff and he's got his own books coming out. He's got. Um, Oh God, I'm blanking on the title right now. He's got something coming out through Darn and Quarterly. Uh, Howl of oh, the Turnip King. Yeah. What's it called? I. Oh, I am. It's all right. No, no. Yeah. But you know, I'm glad you mentioned Bobby because he's reached out to me, and you know, I have this. Uh, and seriously, I sound like an asshole when I say this, but truly, it's like, oh no, no, I mean to get to Bobby, and then I look up, and it's like, oh yeah, that's been a couple of years now. So, Bobby, <laughs> if you're listening, I do apologize, and uh, yeah, I'm gonna, I'll try and reach out to him. And and yeah, man, I mean, believe me, if I could do Word Balloon every day, I would, and to accommodate all the people that want to come on, and and the people that I want to talk to, as initially, I mean, and that's the thing, I'll, you know. So you know what I'm saying. Enough yeah, of my absolutely. apologies. Back to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, his book was – it's called Ward's Valley, and uh, it was with another one of the great artists off of the Pony Books, Brenda Hickey. I completely forgot about her. Okay. Um, but yeah, he's uh, – I, I kept sending him pitches, and I kept sending out pitches to other people that I had connections with, and I just kept running into people at cons and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and somewhere along the way – I'm trying to – okay. I'm trying to get the exact series of events. Um so I also I made I made contact with uh, Whitney Leopard at Boom and have co- done a couple of licensed things for Boom, which we can talk about as well. But oh, okay, at, yeah, and then at, at a at a recent con, I think it was just last. God, was it last near Comic Con? God, it seems like much longer. Um, I uh, through a friend of a friend, I got introduced to Mike Martz and um, um, Lee Kramer at uh, uh, AfterShock. We had breakfast. We, I, I gave him some pitches, and they really liked Moth and Whisper. And it was as I mean, it was as simple as that, and it was as long as and tedious and and you know hard work as that. <laughs> that's um, awesome, man. No, that's yeah, excellent. Yeah, it's been a, it's been a long weird journey, but yeah. Um, and this so this is my first actual original creator owned type thing uh after five years now of working on licensed stuff and it's it's mildly terrifying but you know well but it's good and uh, hey man it's a great first issue and uh tell me about uh, jen hickman how you got in, uh, involved with jen yeah jen so i met jen at uh emerald city a couple of years ago i forget exactly when um through a friend of a friend another artist i've been meaning to work with and um yeah jen's part of the scad crowd and they're they I mean, I just I started hanging out with people at Emerald, and I started looking at Jen's work. I'm like, this is really fucking amazing. I want to I want to find something to do with them. And we we tinkered around. We got a pitch. We put together a pitch that's uh, I still really want to do. But and we also did a very small license thing for Boom. We did a um, an eight page story for them for a collective comic. Um, but Jen just happened to be a, a combination of like six different factors that worked perfectly for this book. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so, so for the book itself, so for Moth and Whisper, Moth and Whisper, it's a, it's a cyberpunk near future, young adult, heisty, thiefy thriller thing, Mm -hmm. uh, with a genderqueer protagonist. And that's like six different things that tie right into what Jen is. (laughs) Um, so Jen is, like I said, I've worked with them for a while now. They've, I know they love, uh, techno stuff. I know they love thiefy heist type narratives. Um, we bonded a lot over the same video games, actually, a lot of which have similar, kind of elements to them that that show up in this like we both really are into the dishonored games deus ex games uh thief a couple others that i'm forgetting um and those all have elements that are that are prominent in moth and whisper and additionally gender is also gender queer themselves and i that's that's an that was an important factor in it it's not the only factor i wouldn't be working with jen if jen wasn't also an amazingly talented artist i mean sure they did they did work on a bunch of the gem and the holograms books actually like some of the the um what was the title? Infinites, I think. It was a sort of the side story one. That was a lot of that was a lot of cool stuff. They did a, a great book called The Dead a while ago. Um, but yeah, I just I happen to know Jen both as an amazing artist and as a person who would then be able to uh, check me <laughs> in a weird way. Um, no, I understand what you're saying. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. You want to get it right? No, I understand. Yeah, because it's it's one of those things. So I'm uh, I always want to be clear about this because I don't want to I don't want to be seen like I'm claiming something for myself and I'm not. I'm a I'm a cisgender straight dude. Uh, I have no particular claim to anything in the LGBTQ community, but I have a whole lot of friends who are part of that community, and I you know it sucks that they get terrible representation basically. And 
the genesis of Moth and Whisper was partly I was tinkering around with like, I don't know, legacy characters and like thief characters and I wanted mm-hmm. to do high stories because I like that stuff. And also just like, you know, I want to do a character whose gender identity is part of their character but not like – well, there was – OK. So a few years ago, there was a book that uh, Magdalene Visaggio wrote a, uh, uh, an editorial about where she claimed, where she said that basically it's it's not so much the problem where a cis uh, author creates a trans character. It is a problem if a cis author wants to tell trans narratives. And I mean this is something that applies for a lot of marginalized communities. I'm, it's yeah. – yeah, this is – this is I mean this is the, the debate that's roiling comics right now. But Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, but it, I mean, it's one of those things where it's a very fine line to walk. I'm not, I don't want to step in anyone's narrative. I want to tell stories about characters that people can relate to and who don't see themselves. And so that's, that's what this was. So I wanted to create a character whose identity was a central part of them, but it wasn't the only part of them. Totally oh. understand. And frankly, and again, as you just said, cisgender, middle-aged white man saying this, <laughs> my problem with Star Trek Discovery, just from a from a gay standpoint was that I didn't see a lot of depth in these characters. I, I love the fact that they have a gay couple, um, right. and, but it, it just seemed like, yeah, that was kind of the most important thing about them rather than what we always got in Star Trek was, you know, deep characters. And, and Stamets is a deep character, but I really felt that his, his, uh, and I forget if they were husband and, and, and wife, but uh, his partner, I, the doctor, I'm like, wow, what a really lousy representation. Again, cis white man saying this. I got to say. Just, it bugged me. It really bugged me because it's like, aren't we great? And it's like, you know, Star Trek used to be able to do both. We've always yeah. had people of color. We've always had strong women. I, I am thrilled that uh, they are thinking about including the LBGTQ uh, com- community. Uh, but but yeah, it's like uh, like you just said, it's like th- that's great and that's interesting and provocative and let's explore that and have that kind of representation. But yeah, I'm glad that that Jen's the type of person that can help you, you know, kind of get it right. I guess. Yeah, yeah. I gotta say, I, I was confused there for a second. I was thinking the, the most recent Star Trek movie. Um, what oh, what the hell was that? Oh, one? Nemesis the, or uh, no, oh, no, oh, no, oh, JJ Abrams, of course. Yeah, the um, new yeah the third uh, one, Star Trek. Frontier. That was that was Star Trek Beyond. Beyond, there we go. I was yeah. thinking that one. I actually haven't watched all Discovery. <laughs> oh, dude, watched... it, it cracks me up how many people that I love that are genuine hard, hardcore Star Trek fans. And I'm oh. like, so have you watched uh, Discovery? They're like, I'm not paying six bucks. God, I'll, I'll <laughs> I'm going to out him. I can't help it. Mark Guggenheim, showrunner oh. for, for Arrow. And he's, oh, I love Star Trek. I'm like, what do you think of Discovery? He's like, I'm not paying six bucks. I'm like, you can afford six bucks, Mr. <laughs> Arrow. What the hell's going on? But yeah, anyway. it's it's partly that, and it's just like signing up for another damn service. I didn't oh, want to have to. Yes, yeah. sir. I I should. I will. I mean, but it's oh, and talking to Star Trek. I mean, Star Trek was one <laughs> hell of an interesting example. This is this is one of those great anecdotes I I read about somewhere. So Star Trek, obviously, not the has. So okay, Star Trek has never actually had a canonically gay character until Sulu in um, Beyond. Like that was right. literally that is the correct. first. Yeah, that is correct. And there was a there was a there was a point. In Next Generation's production, when people were pointing this out, and there was specifically there was a point where there was a, a member of a, a gay Star Trek fan club who, at a conf- at like a press conference, asked Roddenberry, you know, when are we going to see a gay character in Star Trek? And Roddenberry explained that you know he was a guy who grew up in the you know the fifties. He wasn't exactly the right. most enlightened dude, and but he said he's learning. And so in season six, there would be a character who was gay. And it was part of their narrative and, you know, that sort of thing. And then he died and Star Trek was taken oh, over by, yeah. by – what's his name? I cannot – Rick Berman. Yeah, Rick Berman yeah. was the showrunner. Well, yeah, did yeah. – you know, my, my friend Tana Ford, who is uh, a lesbian car- uh, creator, I believe, uh, mm. is uh, – we talked about it. And, and sh- you know, there is that one episode – of Star Trek, where they went to the, the sing the single the, gender, the monogender planet. Yes, yes, that was like the one concession that they made. Yes, <laughs> basically. But well, yes, and again, and again, man. In fairness, I, and I, I'm, I'm shrugging. It's like you know, Philadelphia was such a breakthrough movie, the Tom Hanks film, and yeah. that was only a year or two. That was probably around the same time that they did that that monogender yeah, yeah. planet and and yeah thankfully we've we've you know we've moved ahead but because honestly i i man i and forgive the tan, the star trek tangent we got all night to talk but oh. uh <laughs> but but honestly i i've noticed in recent blogs they kind of shit hammer the original klingon makeup and they refer to it as blackface it's, and i'm sorry but i disagree 
I disagree. It's not blackface. Yeah, no, it's not it's blackface. Not. It is like they're tended. They they kind of make them look kind of swarthy and othery. And sure. They got the, you know, well, the sure. It's a warrior race. race. But yeah, it yeah. was. It could have easily been green. It could have easily been red. I don't think they were thinking horrible black ploitation stereotype when they created the Klingons. I'm sorry, yeah. I don't. And I and I am happy to wrestle anyone under the table that says otherwise. And it and it worries me that. I think that is a younger perception. Well, of, there's a lot. Yeah. You know what I mean? And again, I mean, hey, man, they got all the all the girls are. I mean, it's a misogynistic show. All the yeah. girls have got, you know, <laughs> got who do the not bend roots. over for that clipboard because there's going to be a, a rate, you know, a censorship issue. And I get all that. But I also think that they should be applauded for being as, as diverse as they were at the height of the 60s culture wars. Right, and, they, and that Roddenberry wasn't afraid of saying, "No, this is going to be a multiracial cast," and and gladly, yeah, and also specifically have a Russian guy on the crew, and Damn yeah, straight. and like, and one of the things I always remember reading was that you know the miniskirts at the time that was that was something of a degree of okay, yes, it was fan service, but there was also a degree of liberation to it. It's Absolutely. this, you know, it's it's this outfit that represents a freedom of women to, you know, hey, to women, choose women to, would choose dress, yeah, women were dressing like that. It's, yeah. it, it's just I, the way it was. Yeah, and, at the same and, time, and, yeah, it still and, was chosen by a bunch of male costume designers. And, so I'm and, sure there was, <laughs> and again, two cisgender white males having this discussion. Oh yeah, and, and I'm sure, sure that the women and people of color and gay community are thrilled to hear what we think about all this shit. So right. I understand. I totally under, I get it. But I also, it's like <laughs> you know, we're uh, everyone's doing the best they can, and I think we're moving forward. Right. So but yeah. So with with Moth and Whisper, it was yes. a thing I wanted to make sure that it was <laughs> certainly to Moth and Whisper. Yeah. So I wanted to make sure it was a part of their, I mean, <laughs> what went through my mind also, and this is a weird way to put it and a little bit self-aggrandizing, but like, you know, if they ever make a TV show or a movie or anything out of this, I want to, I want to make their identity so prominent in a way that they can't easily edit it out. You know, I want to make it something where you can't just like, oh, well, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll clean that up for the TV. Like the fact that they're a gender queer character is, is encoded into sort of the DNA of this whole, is this whole project sure. to a degree that to, if they ever made a TV show out of it, you know, God willing, uh, <laughs> I could use the money. Um, if they wouldn't be able to do any, they wouldn't be able to change that and they'd have to accept it as part of the, the, you know, the story going forward. So I don't, I don't want to spoil, but there is kind of even a symbolic they in terms of what the main character does in the book. Uh, Is that I'm, fair I'm, to say? I'm not sure what you're referring to. Well, aren't, symbolic... Moth and, aren't Moth and Whisper? Well, there's also, yeah, there's also a plural they because, so yeah, so, so the premise of it, um, the the premise of it is it's this near future uh, nightmarish classic cyberpunk dystopia, mm-hmm. um, and the two best thieves that have ever been in the city are the moth and the whisper. And the moth right. is someone who can change her appearance at a at a, at a moment and, and trick the the rings off your fingers. And the whisper is the guy who can infiltrate invisibly, and nobody ever knows he was there. And what nobody knows is that they were working together. And what especially nobody knows is that they had a kid together. And so this kid, now that their parents have disappeared, and mysterious circumstances is having to pretend to be both of them. Exactly. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. And I wanted it cause, and, and this is like when I came into this, when I came into thinking about the character, I'm like, okay, if I want to do a gender queer character, I want to build a character. I want to build a story where that element of their identity can be a major part of the story. So I wanted to have a character who, for whom sort of different gender presentations were just, like swapping clothes and was and was natural to them and they and they were comfortable in whatever sort of gender presentation they could be and what kind of line of work would that be an advantage and it's like oh well I'm having to be a spy infiltrator type so it kind of came all out of that and this idea of it being an inexperienced but really highly trained kid who who knows a lot but hasn't ever been on the streets who's desperately searching for their parents who's having this sort of my old nervous breakdown the whole way through because they can't do what their parents were doing. Um, yeah, that's, I mean, it just, it just all kind of congealed into this, into this, into this, uh, into this thriller storyline thing, which we weren't initially even planning to market sort of as YA, but I realized, you know, there's nothing stopping it from being YA. It's a teen main character. I can keep myself from swearing or doing any horrible violence. So, uh, yeah, let's make it a YA book. <laughs> and that's great because by the same token, I didn't even, I had forgotten if, the Aftershock people had told me that it's a YA book. It didn't feel like a YA book in the worst way. It seemed yeah. like a solid caper book 
where, you know, again, all these characters are acting as you would expect them to act in a cyberpunk world of espionage and, and thievery. Yeah. So, and there's, and, you know, again, they're, they're thieves more than they are costumed heroes. So, so the, you know, as far as the original Moth and Whisper and, of course, uh, the, the child Nikki. as well. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. And it's, and it's, I, yeah, I'm I'm veering kind of close to superhero in bits of it. I mean, sure. it's very much there's very much elements of like Catwoman in there. There's very much elements of um, I don't know, Phantomas and other other kind sure. of or the chameleon, point, the chameleon, the oh, chameleon from Marvel, certainly. especially yeah, shapeshifter type characters. Yeah. There's a lot of that. There's a lot of that DNA, but it's not. Yeah, I don't ever want to make it a superhero book. I mean, it's it is it is classic cyberpunk, and that's so. This okay, so I got to go on a mini rant about this because it's <laughs> something it's something that I thought about a, a lot about when I was when I was putting this together was cyberpunk has has cyberpunk has sort of been distilled or not distilled. Cyberpunk has sort of been watered down actually to the aesthetic. You know, cyberpunk is very much at this point like, oh yeah, it's neon, there's buildings, it's raining, it's kind of noir, but like futuristic <laughs> and things suck, and it's. And like that's kind of the cyberpunk veneer, sure. and there's Blade it's Runner. very easy to apply to things. But at the same time, there's I'm I'm the guy who grew up. Well, I didn't grow up reading reading uh, William Gibson, but I grew I read him when I was too young to be reading him. I'll tell you that. Okay. And <laughs> classic cyber, you know, Neuromancer and and um, sure. uh, Count Zero and 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 all the all his classic books. And and what's crucial about those books is that it's the aesthetic is almost incidental. What's important is that it's about you know this very cynical look at technology. This recognition that technology isn't going to save the world if it isn't tied to significant social changes. You know, otherwise, the latest new advance will just be co-opted by existing hierarchies and used as another tool to keep people down. Um, God, I'm sounding like an Alex Jones listener over here. Um, no, nah, I, 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 I know where your politics are, so that's not true. But, but I'll be honest. No, the current the current status quo of social media and technology. Ugh. I think is a legitimate fear because yeah, again, I you know I, I haven't gotten to the point yet where I put those timers on so you're not you know online, but I know other people that have, yeah. and and yeah, I I worry about wasting time all the time now and and being too tied to the tech. So yeah, oh, yeah, there's I mean there's there's a legitimate fear of that, and there's also the problem that now cyberpunk is almost like it's too real in some ways. Absolutely, <laughs> like talking about We're is here. Almost, it's yeah. not even fiction. Um, but it but there's still that that essence of the idea of you know, looking at, you know, this technology isn't going to save the world, no matter how much we hope that this thing is going to be the thing that cures all our ills and fixes the environment. Someone somewhere along the way is going to misuse it or or Absolutely. sell it to us in a way that we don't need to be sold to. And that's and that and the perspective of it being told from the bottom up, you know, told from the perspective of people who don't necessarily have a lot of power, who are who are, you know, on the streets, who who are living in the shadows of things. That's sure. always what defines cyberpunk for me. And so when I went into this, I'm realizing as I was writing it more and more, I'm like, you know, this is this is just sort of a straight up another cyberpunk. Um and I'm happy with that because I love cyberpunk. I love, I love classic well executed cyberpunk stuff. I love, you know, these these dirty futures that that really remind us that it it takes a lot more than shiny chrome to to really change the world. Um, and this is also incidentally why I have such a burning hatred for steampunk shit because steampunk started as an aesthetic. It doesn't. Yeah, I mean, That's cyberpunk. Hilarious because I do have I do have the exact opposite <laughs> feeling about steampunk. But go on. Oh really? Oh, oh see, well, like... I, but I and I'll admit. And again, there are all these little divisions of 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 each era. I am more of a diesel punk fan than I am a steam. I do like steampunk okay. yeah, because diesel I punk do appreciate thinking about. I mean, Jules Verne was a fucking genius, man. Well, yeah, but that's the thing. Like, Jules Verne is in, is almost not steampunk because he was writing when steam was the thing. Right, basically. right. Yeah, that's like, true. That's true. Just the, just the fact that like steampunk started off as like, uh, what if we slap some uh, gears and shit on this? You know, it's like that. <laughs> that was like the, the the basic starting point of steampunk. And I know, okay, to be fair, I know later writers have come along and done more talking about political implications and like what would the world really look like if the sure. British Empire sort of expanded in the 1900s and or the 1800s and technology. He ran rampant, and I mean, hell, William Gibson himself wrote the the, the Difference Engine, which was an early yes. steampunk book, and there was a lot of the yep. the political stuff in that. But like, <laughs> that's just part of my my irrational hatred for <laughs> for steampunk. And I know it's irrational. I know it's a little bit it's yeah. it's it's biased, but it, yeah, it was it was something that rubbed me the wrong way because cyberpunk seemed to come specifically from a set of 
very clear ideas about this is how we write our future and this is how we're thinking about the future. And steampunk just seemed to come from like, uh, yeah, slap some uh, brass and leather and shit on this. And, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, that's my irrational hatred. Yeah, that's that's my that's, that's right. my steampunk story. <laughs> But yeah, so this is a cyberpunk story kind of through and through, which is a little bit less relevant these days because cyberpunk is, like I said, like, like we were saying, it's the it's the milieu we're living in. But it's it's still a milieu that I think is worth using and talking about. And specifically, there's more of the focus here on surveillance and monitoring and being properly tagged and mocked at all times, which is obviously hugely relevant. <laughs> so, Absolutely. Well, that, yeah. I was going to ask you that question in terms of – uh, espionage and, and capers and thievery in today's hyper technical world where every move is being captured. I, I've talked, Matt Wagner and I have talked about how, how does Bruce Wayne hide the bat cave these days with Google yeah. Maps all over the place? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, there's the there's the picture floating around Tumblr. I don't even know the artist who made it, but it was someone where it's uh, Lois Lane sitting at her computer uploading her latest picture of her and Superman, and then Facebook saying, "Oh, would you like to tag Clark Kent in this?" You know. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't credit the artist. I don't know the artist off the top that of my head. That was great, that's, though. That's that's genius. I love. But it. that is, I mean, that's what it is. Like that's yeah. that's the idea. But is this idea of social media being so integrated into this future that yeah, everything is tagged, and that's what makes i mean that's what that's what sort of defines nikki then as a character is the fact that they're outside the system so this is okay so we went <laughs> jen and i went real deep into a discussion on terminology because when i first wrote um some of the like uh, marketing material and stuff like that uh i used the words gender fluid and gender queer sort of interchangeably to talk about nikki as a character and mike actually pointed out that those aren't those are basically synonyms, but not quite. They're not quite the same word. We want to go okay. with the other. It's, I mean, the terminology. The terminology of the community is is rapidly, you know, evolving, and everything is changing. So it's hard to keep Understood. up. With sort of what's, yes, yes, it is. I, yeah. So again, cisgendered uh, middle aged <laughs> man. Yeah. I completely. Yeah. I honestly, and it's like, all right, I, I accept that, and try to remember what is what is appropriate, and and even your use of of the you know they. To, yeah. to refer to the the individual and everything, it's like okay, you know. yeah. Yeah, oh hey, believe me, I've had to train myself too. I mean, I sure. I will say I'm proud of something actually. Whenever I've slipped up and called Nikki by a gendered pronoun, I've ki- I've called them he and she in about equal proportion. So at least I'm not imagining them as basically in quotes, you know, male or basically female. I'm with but you. yeah, at least at least my subconscious is just as you know, just as uh, clear on the fact that they're neither male nor female. <laughs> Got um, it. Yeah, but yeah. So uh, so Jen and I talked about this, and Jen uh, Jen brought up a really good point, which is that they are substantially the same term at, at this point. But there was an added sort of textual element to the idea of them being gender queer, in that queer also means to sort of be outside of a system, queering the system, being in some way uncategorizable or or outside of whatever boxes you have. And that made sense for Nikki in a larger sense because they're also, you know, they their face profiles doesn't exist in the municipal systems. They don't have a birth certificate. They don't have a social Nikki's off the grid. Okay. Nikki's completely off the grid. And so we went with gender queer because that's, it resonates with the idea of them, them, them being queer to the entire system, not just binary gender, but also just to the world as it is. Understood. Um, and it's a shitty world. I mean, that's a very <laughs> – <laughs> it's half of the stuff I'm writing about isn't even exaggerations. Like that's the, that's the really terrible part. I have no, I have no <laughs> doubt, honestly. Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and then it, we've got this mystery obviously of who knocked off uh, Nikki's parents and uh, it could be one of two villains at least as far as Nikki kind of pairs it down in the, in the first issue. Yeah, Nikki. Nikki. Well, Nikki is even is even clearer than that. Nikki basically thinks it's Ambrose Wolf. Ambrose Wolf, the 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 biggest crime lord in the city, and it is always just the city. By the way, it's it's very transmit of me. It's <laughs> it's it's just or the Matrix. Actually, frankly, does it does it similarly? It's it's just the city. The I mean, city. this is sure. I don't ever want to tie it down to any real place. But yeah, the, uh, Ambrose Wolf is is the dude that Nikki is aiming for through this whole five issue story, and it's. <laughs> we're not going to answer the question of what happened to Nikki's parents in this story, but we are going to get some answers. We're just going to end up with more questions really. So <laughs> interesting. Okay. okay. Yeah. It's we're, we're, we're thinking long-term we haven't. So this, I, so I, to clarify this as well, it is a five issue. It is a five issue series as of right now with the possibility of future series. If maybe, you know, God willing, the Creek don't rise that could you. happen. Yeah. Um, yeah, if, the, so if it's yeah, if it's well accepted, then you you've got more stories to tell. Absolutely, yeah. Cool. But at the same time, it's just if it's just five issues, it's still a good it's still a good solid story. So excellent. 
Yeah, I'm really proud of it. I'm I'm so happy with with Jen's work. Jen's this is particularly. I wish I could show them. To, I could show them to you, frankly. Um, the covers of the books have actually been a, a really surprisingly great part of it. I mean, I knew Jen's art was great, but like the covers that they're doing for each issue are really. Oh man, we came up with a whole bunch of alternates for some of these. Where is? Oh hey, I think I can just drag and drop this to Skype. <laughs> I'm gonna see if I can if I can copy. Uh, I guess not. Um, no worries, man. But yeah, I'm on my backup computer as well, so it may not graphically uh, translate. <laughs> Dan Slots sure. tried to send me stuff on this computer before, and it's like I, I can't see it, Dan. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm having to do this on my desktop because my laptop is dying slowly. So I understand. I had that but problem, yeah. So. N- Jen has done some really phenomenal stuff doing really simple, like just using uh, black, white, gray, and then a really deep red um, to do these really intense silhouetted type things. It's uh, it, they look phenomenal and I, I really can't wait to see them on shelves because they're, they're very distinctive. And that's a, that's been a surprising, I guess not surprising. I can't, I was, yeah, I'm really surprised that the Jen could draw it. No, um, that's been a part where I didn't expect that it was going to be so fantastic and it really has been. So yeah, there's a, there's a link right there. Um, oh, thank you. Okay. Yeah, I think that should work for you. Yep. <laughs> I think I set the permissions right. I can never remember. I'll, uh, I'll click on it and we'll see what we get. And as we're doing that, no, and I, and obviously people know because they've listened to the beginning of the episode. Full disclosure: AfterShock has been uh, sponsoring Word Balloon this month, and uh, sure. and I'm glad because honestly, I, I do like the product, and I like uh, I like the ambitious stories that uh, the creators that I know have been doing, and was really happy when when Steve uh, pointed out your your guys' uh, story as well. Yeah, and, and it's I, terrific. Yeah, I have to. I mean. I talk them up because I'm working for them, but I also, I mean, I wouldn't have approached them if I didn't think that they were doing some really good stuff. And I mean, I love that they're, they're, they love the high concept and I love the high concept too. Yep. I love stories that, that have some really far out concept that they take as far as they can. I mean, both of Marguerite, not both. How many series have Marguerite Bennett doing for them right now? But I mean, insects. Oh, I thought it was and, just the two. Maybe it is more than the two. I, I can't keep track, but both insects and animosity have been fantastic. Oh, there's the animosity spinoff. Um, Evolution, I want to oh, say. Oh, yes, but, of course. Okay. But yeah, I mean, like, that stuff has been phenomenal. Um, there are other series that I've just been – I'm still Garth going Ennis. through their catalog. Oh, Jimmy's yeah. Jimmy's Bastards is great. I God. haven't had a chance to read the uh, Flyer uh, military story, but I know he always does amazing military stories. And my buddy Tim Seeley has a story there. Phil Hester has a story there. I'll be talking yeah. to Paul Jenkins about his new series in a few weeks and stuff. No, Aftershock. God, Ray Fox, Jackpot, Tremendous Crime Story. Um, you know, no, I, I, I honestly, and again, March knows what he's doing. Joe Pruitt knows what he's doing. Um, those are the two main, uh, aftershock guys that I know, and I do appreciate their taste. I've always liked what Pruitt did at Desperado and Mike's work with the X-Men in the Batman world and everything speaks for itself. Yeah. And no, I, I hope to talk to them as well about aftershock. I think it's a, I think it's a smart company and I think they're much like boom when it first came out. I was an immediate fan of Boom, where it's like, okay, oh. they're attacking genres and stories. They're, and obviously, too, in both cases, Boom and Aftershock, there's a couple superhero stories. Wade has his story, and Jimmy and Amanda uh, had their had their kind of superhero story as, as well. Oh, yeah. Uh, for that. But also, let's that. let's really look at some other genres, and, what, and especially, too, going to high-concept people that come to them with really interesting ideas. So yeah. again, uh, sponsored by Aftershock. I admit it yeah, again. But, this is, but, this, this but, has been the commercial segment of the show. No, yeah, no question. <laughs> yeah, I don't have to do a middle. Uh, I don't have to do a middle spot now. Yeah. So <laughs> um, tick that, tick that box. Yeah, but no, it's a yeah, genuine. It's a genuine appreciation of what Aftershock is trying to do. Yeah, no, I, I, I appreciate that they're. I describe them as kind of the new Vertigo, which is a little more insulting now that Vertigo is back in itself. But like, <laughs> they were doing the same kind of thing that Vertigo does. The Vertigo did back in the '90s when yeah. I was really getting back into comics, sure. where it was, um, you know, yeah, they're doing they're they're doing the really high concept, big stuff that that doesn't have a home in a lot of other places. So absolutely, IDW, Black Crown, you know. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I love Black- Shelley. She's she's great, and I think you know, I think you need to do that to stand out. And I think mm-hmm. they're making the right choices. Getting back to Jen's art and stuff and her cover art, uh, I I always uh, find myself looking at the racks and I see an aftershock book and and usually stands out. Mm-hmm. So I think yeah, I, I think they're paying attention to that. I like the cover. I mean, I love the the the, the dress that they do for it. And also, I I do not know who to credit for the logo, but the logo is phenomenal too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the there's that slanted MW that works really well. I knew that would stand out well, but they really made it pop. Um, 
our letter. I should also mention our letter at Marshall Dillon. Um, the friend, I was gonna, I was gonna mention Marshall Dillon, but by by all means, you tell me how great he is. Well, yeah, and I mean he's he he came in and he had these great ideas. He's there's very very subtle like font differences when Nikki is pretending to be this person or this person when Nikki is yes. in this pers- persona or that persona. There's very subtle font differences that that spell a lot of, that do a lot without actually spelling it out, and it's it's subtle and it's really good and it's. I mean, lettering is that art where it's, God, you know, it's like grammar in a novel. You'd only notice it if it goes, if it's completely fucked it up. But right, <laughs> yeah, hundred yeah, percent, man. No, you're absolutely right. And the letterers do not get their due oh, for yeah. what they provide to make the the reading experience as great as it is. And I, Marshall's one of my favorite people. Another another Minnesota oh, yeah. guy. Is he really? I, God, thought, I had no idea. I, I'm I'm reasonably <laughs> certain that he's from Minnesota. Yeah, he every now that? and then will come down to Chicago, and and that's usually when I see him most. Uh, beyond conventions, because you oh, know yeah. he, he used to be with Devils do, so he's yes. tight with you know the Sealys and the Nortons and uh, the Chicago Devils do contingent that's that's still around here and stuff. So naturally, I see I see Marshall a couple times a year. No, great guy, great. Yeah, I'm looking forward. to I'm going to be able to meet him at uh, New York this year, so that's going to be fun. Oh, that's great! I'll be in New York as well. So I hope oh, to see you guys yeah. there. Very good. Yeah. Well, you know New York. Yeah, you know, I've been there a couple of years. Yeah. It's... Well, and, and I mean, and man, you know, I used to love when they had it in the North Wing, the Artist Alley. Because a nice, big, mm-hmm. airy room and natural light, and it was away from all the nonsense on the main floor that's just too damn crowded. Oh, God. And, God. and, and you know, man, last year, they're down in the basement. God, and, yeah, they were stuffed in there, and that, that basement level was just <laughs> impenetrable. God. And humid as hell. And oh, it was, God. God, it was like being in Crimson Tide, a submarine <laughs> movie. It really was. It's like, oh, my God. Jesus. Ugh. So, yeah, I am uh, – I it's – I am always happy to see everybody at New York Comic Con. The Javits Center sucks, and I don't know. It's <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, they should have kept. They should have yeah. kept the manga and the uh, anime separate from C two E two. Or pardon me, and uh, New York Comic Con because it's just too much all at once. Oh, it's you so can't many- move. Yeah, you know. Yeah, I I don't get out to cons as much as I'd like, but New York and Chicago are the two that I tend to hit a lot. I didn't make Chicago this year just because of conflicts, but it's. I mean, I also I went to conflicts. Of- I like that. We should call oh, it that. Oh boy! God. No, I like that. <laughs> I like that a lot. I, no, it was conflicts. I respect that, but that's true. They should be in particular when it's convention problems. I have conflicts. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. yeah. It, in Chicago, like I went to I went to college in Chicago, so I I love the town. Where'd you go? I, University of Chicago. So oh, that's outside. Wow, very impressive. Look at you. Uh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I'm oh, one of those God. educated English majors who can't hold down a real job. Yeah. Hey, man, okay. <laughs> I, you know, um, I'm thinking of how long ago it was because it was the early 2000s. They had a humanities festival there, and it and they focused on comics. Oh. And in fact, I saw someone uh, tweet to Neil Gaiman saying, "Oh, I saw you when you were at the University of Chicago, and you did this amazing interview with um, Will Eisner." And I'm like, "Oh yeah, I was there." And it was like about. <laughs> About like three or four years before I started Warble, and Scott McLeod was there, oh, and Art wow. Spiegelman, and oh, it was just fantastic, and it was great because it was such a university presentation and post presentation <laughs> because we were all in a big lecture room, they were on stage, they did their talk. When they were done, everybody was in the lobby, and it was just this nice mellow happening where I could walk up to Neil Gaiman and say, I've loved your work since Black Orchid. And I could walk up to Will Eisner and say, geez, I read The Spirit back when it was in, and I had a couple old Warren publishing Spirit reprints and oh, stuff. Wow. <laughs> and yeah, I know, and they could not have been nicer, really interesting guys. And, oh, I was just happy as hell like that. I'm like, see, this is what comics should be. So, no, man, that's that's a great school. And, I mean, you know, yeah, of course, they split the atom there and everything, too. Oh, yeah, you forget know. that crap, though. They hit comics, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't, go for the, I didn't go for the science. What are you talking about? But, yeah, it's kind of – it's like it's the closest thing to an Ivy League school uh, here in the Midwest as far as I'm concerned. Oh, yeah, that – well, it's it's it, it's priced like it, too. I shouldn't, well, I shouldn't talk smack on my alma mater. No, hey, I, but – yeah, but let's, let's give them credit because – uh, and again, forgive the soapbox, but in this current environment of, oh, we all need our safe spaces and stuff, I was really proud of the University of Chicago saying, you know, you got to learn how the real world works. And yeah, there's some shitty people out there. But mm-hmm. yeah, no, you got you got to learn how to deal. And, I, and I'm kind of I, I appreciated their stance on safe spaces and saying, no, you know, you're going to hear diverse voices and you might not like some of the diverse voices you hear, but that's what life has in store for you in the years to come. And I'm a little ambivalent on it. 
I, I mean, I'm a little ambivalent on it. I remember reading about, oh, was it Chicago? Actually, it might have been Iowa. No, it was Chicago, I think. They were a little more, I don't know. I feel like they were being a little more provocative than they needed to be. They were trying to make it, um, I don't know. Maybe we got to cut this bit. I'm trying to remember what I read. Oh, okay. now. I can't even think about it. I'm, I'm a little bit lukewarm on that stance just because what I remember reading was that it was a little bit, it was it was sort of perf- how how to put this performatively provocative. They were trying to be openly a little bit. Um, eh, hell, I don't know what I'm talking about. I wasn't okay, there. Well, <laughs> I mean, I, I'll leave my I'll leave my soapbox. But yeah, if you don't want to talk about it, we'll move on. Yeah, I don't. I I don't. I'm not informed enough about it to to say anything on either way. Really, uh, it's all good, man. Yeah, I'll um, get in trouble. Don't worry about it. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah. More controversy <laughs> in comics. That's what we all need. Yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, the University of Chicago. I mean, it was a, I, when I was there. There was there were a couple. I mean, there was still definitely a comics element to it. I took a. I actually took a class from Ivan Brunetti. He taught a, a semester thing there. Of course, yes. Yeah. Well, he's normally. At, I mean, he's normally at um, um, uh, the visual uh, Chicago School of Visual Arts. What's the? What's oh, the... I didn't realize that either. But yes, I mean, I've seen him at a million. Uh, Printers Row, uh, Chicago Tribune book fairs. Oh yeah, yeah, you know his 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 comics are there and always in interviews and stuff. No, I love Ivan. He's very interesting to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's I, I it's University of Chicago in general. It's I love the place. There's been some cool people come out of there, and I keep in touch with everyone. And it's yeah, it's it was a weird place to. I mean, it's still a weird place to be. You're on the south side. You're in this kind of little gentrified bubble. You're a little bit yes. divorced from reality. Yeah, but the but yeah, it was. It was a wild. It was a wild place to be. Do you know about Scav Hunt? Has that been on your radar ever? <laughs> Scav Hunt. <laughs> this is this thing we could we could probably cut this for time. But this, yeah, go for it. <laughs> there's this. This it's been doing it for 20 years now. It's this bizarre scavenger hunt collection thing. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. where there's a list of like 300 insane items you got to find or build or make in like three days time over Mother's Day weekend. Yeah. Um, oh, if you've heard of that, uh, what's the other one? Gish Gishwis Greatest Internet Scavenger Hunt the world's ever seen. It's an internet phenomenon thing. That's based off of the Chicago scav hunt thing. Anyway, okay. it's a it's a big nonsense, crazy party thing where you have to make all these ridiculous items, and some of them are are every year. There's three or four big ones that make the news. Like it's it it first kind of hit the news in the '90s when they asked for people to build an actual functioning nuclear reactor in their dorm room and so a couple of students <laughs> a couple of students got almost like they had everything but the but the plutonium but, the plutonium. but the, yeah <laughs> i mean it's the kind of thing where it gets in the newspaper every year or so because it's like oh check out these wacky college students building this stuff um and you get into it you know i was part of a house that was really really uh, dorm that was really into it so i got into okay. it a little bit and it, it also i ended up creating one of my favorite uh one of my favorite works of all time which was the um uh, the Fantastic Four and Queer Eye for Doctor Doom. I still have a five-page scan of that somewhere. <laughs> it was, yeah, it was I, when, when people look back at my oeuvre, that's going to be top of the list right there. I thought. <laughs> hey, that now building a nuclear reactor like that, that's a Barney Miller episode. Oh, God. Saying. A student builds one, and they can't figure out what the hell it is. And Dietrich, the intellectual of Barney Miller, like he hasn't been on camera the whole time, and his first line is, what the hell's with the atom bomb over there? <laughs> It's the University of Chicago. You keep the tradition going. Every 50 years or so, they build a nuclear reactor on campus. Exactly, yeah. man. That's fantastic. <laughs> That's great. No, yeah. I lo- and you're right. Absolutely. It is this little gentrified bubble surrounded by Chicago's south side. And Art, yeah. Art Spiegelman, just a couple years ago, did an amazing presentation. Uh, and I kept trying to get him on Word Balloon to talk about it. He only did this in a couple cities. He found silent graphic novels that date back to the late 1800s. And uh, if, uh, into the 1950s, but well before, mm-hmm. you know, when did, when was the first graphic novel and everything? Yeah. And they're amazing. And he would show them, show vignettes of stories, and he had this little jazz combo with him that would oh, do cool. like a soundtrack. And it was it was amazing. It was incredible. And he'd explain, okay, this is the illustrator, and this was his background, and this is where he came from. And yeah, you know, he in 1948 he he produced a thousand copies of this book that went nowhere but we found it and here it is and and just incredible finds of this you know great illustrated work that you know kind of came and went but he was bringing it back 
So, yeah, Damn. that reminds me. I should try and see if he uh, still is doing anything with that, and I'd still love to talk to him eventually. Yeah, he he actually, the year I, or, uh, while I was there in, in, at the university, he, he did a, um, like a one-day workshop thing, and he came in oh, and did a lecture. It was, it was sort of more generally on, I think, just kind of the evolution of comics, basically, just sort of a, not quite standard, but, you know, it's it, uh, a talk he could have, he's probably been given for years now. Yeah, brass tacks, I'm with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but that was really cool. Yeah, I got my copy. Sure. Of, I got my signed copy of Mouse somewhere. You know. <laughs> I, it could not be a great. I mean, seriously, such a, and, and as I mentioned, he was at that Humanities Festival years earlier. Oh yeah, so. yeah, yeah. I wonder if that workshop was that workshop within the last ten years. Oh, no, actually, God, I graduated oh, in two thousand seven. So oh, okay, okay, yeah. Yeah, sorry uh, to make you feel yeah. old. I'm, I'm, I'm no, young. No, it's all old. good, man. Oh, please. <laughs> yeah, I'm over that. That's all right. <laughs> but oh, yeah, no. he 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 came in. To, you know, I remember that he was there too. And oh, and um, um, oh God, why am I blanking on his name? Jimmy Corrigan. Uh, oh my God, Chris, Chris, Chris Ware. Ware. Chris Ware. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah he also did. He was there. He was there as well. Yeah, it's a, you know a lot of Chicago indie weirdo style people. No, we have exact. You know, that's the great thing about our community here, uh, the comics community. We have great indie people, and we've got great mainstream people, as as you do up in the Twin Cities as well. Yeah, you know, I. The Twin Cities is growing interestingly. There's some really cool people. I mentioned Xander Cannon a while ago, and he he's got a studio. So first of all, there was him and Kevin Cannon, who was of yes. absolutely no relation. Yes, um, which is the fun. <laughs> I love that part of the story. Um, and they they started Big Time Attic, and it still sort of exists. It's basically just a studio now. Um, and technically, it's well, actually, no, it's it's been rebranded. We're World Monster Headquarters, um, and it's Xander Cannon, uh, John Bivens, um, Pete Wartman. Uh, a couple of the people I'm completely blanking. Oh, Elliot Ray Hall. He's doing a thing for Aftershock. He's associated. Cool. Uh, yeah, it's and, – and so there's some there's some people who are working in straight up kind of traditional print comics. But we've also – there's a pretty strong web comics contingent. I mean there's like Diana Nock, Blue Delaquanti, J.N. Monk, um, David McGuire just moved up here. There's a lot of interesting, weird <laughs> comics creators in place. Isn't, we actually, Jerkins, isn't Dan Jerkins up there too? God, I think he is. Yeah. He, I was going to say, I'm, I'm reasonably certain that he's still Twin Cities technically or close enough to it that it, you'd be, consider him that. Yeah, I think he is. Um, God, is Walt Simonson still in town? I'm trying to remember. No, Walter's, uh, Walter's East Coast now. Oh, OK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, never mind. Yeah. But yeah, um, there's – yeah, there's there's some big name people who were in town. And we actually – we had a um, – we had another we, so there's a couple local conventions. We have we have our Wizard World spinoff, Minneapolis Fan Fusion, um, but we also have a couple straight up volunteer led local cons, Fall Con and Spring Con. And yeah, then I know Fall, I, yes, I know Fall Con and Spring Con quite well. Absolutely. Oh yeah, yeah. And then we've also just this year they revived a, a con that's happened a couple times called Autoptic, um, which is hell to pronounce, but great for uh, search engines. Um, <laughs> And that's and that was a lot of fun too. We had some really great people come out for that. We had uh, Craig Thompson and, and Melody Gilman and excellent uh, Rose Revel- Good man. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So so Minneapolis is turning into an interestingly hip, cartooning, comicing town. Um, sure. A cool way, yeah. And like I said, there's also partly it's the it's the MCAD connection. It's the College of Art and Design having that that line of creators come out every few years is uh, it's a pretty cool thing. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Very very cool. Well, I'm, I'm I'm quite impressed with uh, this first issue of Moth and Whisper. And, Thank you. Uh, and, can I yeah? Play, can I talk, on, please? Well, yeah. So I, so I actually also want to talk about the other thing I've been doing, which is uh, I'm working on the Adventure Time comics right now from Boom. Oh, that's great! Hey, yeah, fantastic, man. <laughs> Thank you. So this is uh, this is coming out what Friday? I'm trying to remember. <laughs> yeah, probably yes. This Friday. Yes. Okay, then I can talk about it. <laughs> I had to double check with the with the with my editor on that for press releases. Oh, so okay. yeah, so Adventure Time, um, you know, they just had the series finale this past Monday. It's been going on for ten years now. It's a fantastically weird cartoon. It's you know, even the comics have won Eisner's, the show's won Emmys. Absolutely. And they are asking me to work on it, and it's been a blast and a half. Um it all came out of so I, I mentioned earlier that I had talked with Whitney Leopard from Boom, uh, and she's uh been moved in position to to be the editor on the Adventure Time books. And so last year she was like, "Hey, do you want to write like three years of Adventure Time?" And I'm like, "Hell yes, I do." The show's ending is my last chance to do it. So I did this mini series um, called Adventure Time, beginning at the end, which was meant to sort of not quite tie into the finale, but sort of run parallel to it and just be this homage to you know this fantastically weird cartoon show. Yeah. Have you discovered? Did you watch some of it? Did you get into it? I have to confess, I am. I appreciate it. I am. I have not watched it. I am. I was one of the last to jump on Rick and Morty 
Oh, luckily boy. I managed to do it in the in the third season while it was still going on. Oh, nice. But, okay. Yeah, I'm, I I am late to the game on a lot of uh, current animation, but oh, I do I do yeah. respect it. And also, as you said, hand in hand, uh, the comics have been exceptional, and oh. they've gotten great web and underground c- comic people to do great work. And that's as, I know that's the case as well with Rick and Morty. But continue with Adventure Time, please. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. So Adventure, yeah. I mean, they've had Ryan North and Kate Leth. Um, yes. Uh, Meredith Grand, yeah, they've they've had some fantastic people working on it, so I'm getting to to join those noble, lofty ranks. That's awesome, and man. It's yeah, it's been a blast. It's been it's been daunting to work on something that has such a specific voice. <sighs> voice, yeah. I mean, it's it's a show that a lot of people it can kind of be easily written off as like, man, they must have been so stoned when they made this. Like it's <laughs> it's very easy to write off as just like weird shit happens and crazy cartoon stuff but it's there's an emotional density to it there's a core to it that really that that's hard to find in any other media that i think they've they've managed to stay consistently good at for years now and they you know all the way through to the end actually because it just ended dimaggio didn't dimaggio play the dog john yes yep yeah and you know bender of course from futurama and and other voices but uh, and of course the joker in under the red hood that's right Oh, DC yeah, movie yeah. and everything. And uh, what's the guy's name, the creator of Adventure Time? Ted? Uh, Pendleton Ward. Pendleton uh, Ward, excuse me. I thought yeah, it was I, Ted for some reason. I don't know uh, why. Yeah, it's, it's, Much it's, like your own name. but exactly. uh, Yeah, it's, it's, it's a name all good people have. But yeah, I, saw, I, I saw him at uh, New York Comic Con before the show. Um, he did a, really? a great – yeah, a great discussion uh, about – uh, YouTube and and you know creating the stuff there and then bringing it to the mm-hmm. show and just what was happening with animation and God this was I'm shrugging now at least six or seven years ago I mean this is eleven two thousand eleven two thousand twelve oh but yeah okay. it was great yeah. it was really really uh, you know very interesting yeah he's remained he's remained part of it he's not the showrunner or he was I mean he, the, he wasn't the showrunner anymore um, he's he w- he was still voicing stuff up until the very last episode. I don't know what he's working on now. I my god, I want to see what he's working on now because sure. yeah, there's a lot coming from that voice that was really t- just incredibly it, it was it was the adventure of being a kid. You know, it was just it was just about a boy and his dog and there was weird shape-shifting and magic aliens and bizarre nightmare dream sequences, but there was a very simple sort of emotional core to it that made it work really well and it's yeah, I I can't wait to see what the other people involved with it. And DiMaggio, I actually I heard an interview with him at one point where I like the way that he described it. He talked about doing the voice for it. He says, "Yeah, basically Jake is my own voice with just a little bit of a hug on it." You know? <laughs> and it was it's just like it is when you listen to an interview with him. It's just his normal speaking voice is basically the exact same. He's just just a little bit warmer, man. Just wants to kind of bring everyone in a little bit. It was it's it's subtle. I love it a lot though. We're talking hearing he- voice actors talk about their characters. Yeah. He's amazing, and I've I've uh, he's been on Word Balloon. I've seen him and had conversations with him at conventions since then as well. Always a just good down to earth dude, and I I do he, I I just love the guy. And I had like I said, I've had the opportunity to interview him a couple times, and he's just amazing. And I am embarrassed that I am not as uh, well versed on my Adventure Time as oh. I should be with him. <laughs> well, but uh, but I root for him on every project that he's in because he's such a great guy, and I think a brilliant comedian as well. Oh yeah, I've, oof, I does he do stand? Does he have like stand up recordings? I gotta no, find but you know, we, I I consider him a comedian sure. based on the work that he does. I mean, he's got great timing. I, you know, it's it's funny. I just listed on Facebook a bunch of uh, artists that I saw perform live, and I don't know if he came from sketch, but he seems to have that kind of instinct. And there is that distinction, I think, because I list, I listed all the stand ups that I really appreciated that I saw mm-hmm. live, and then I'm like, you know, I saw a real, really great uh, sketch people before they became famous as well, and immediately like Dan Castellaneta, Lynetta, the uh, voice of Homer, and Richard mm. Kind. Uh, who's become a big character actor and stuff, and and that's the thing. And Stephen Colbert and Bonnie Hunt. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I saw these people again. Chicago, Second City. So I had that opportunity. Um, and and yeah, it's like, well, wait a minute. They they count. They're they're comedians, even though they're not stand ups. They are comedians. So sure, yeah. And they have. I mean, the distinctive voices are such. Uh, yeah, when. So my father, he taught at MCAT, and he taught uh, history of animation and film, and wow. he. Uh, yeah, so he never he wasn't teaching the production of it, he was just teaching history of it. So I grew up watching a hell of a lot of cartoons <laughs> and just growing up and listening to all these voices and eventually getting to the point where I'm like, wait a minute, is that you know, is that Jim Cummings again? Is that Tris McNeil? Is that whoever? And it's it's become a mild interest of mine. I, I really 
I love digging into voice actors and exactly how they get into it. I still haven't seen – there's those documentaries um, behind the uh, – behind the voice? Oh, uh-huh. the, I know that voice. I yeah, know that, that voice, yes. Yeah, that's that's one of the things that I talked about with John because he, he co-produced that. Oh, and, of course he did. And he, he's been trying to get it made into a reality show for years. And it's like I've got so much footage and you know I can obviously continue with you know what's happened since. And I'm like, yeah. So, I mean, I'm always like, like I said, whenever I see him at conventions, I'm like, what's going on? He's like, we're still working on it. We're still pitching it. So I hope Netflix or one of the streaming uh, services take him up on it because I agree with you. These are genius actors. Mm. And I forget the guy's name that does. uh, He did Marty on the Back to the Future cartoons, but he also did. And this shows you this guy's range. um, He did Fred Flintstone in the most recent incarnation. And he literally broke down that, well, you know, when Alan Reed was doing it in the 60s, he sounded like this, did a letter perfect Alan Reed. And I forget the Flintstone uh, pebbles or, yeah, the Flintstone vitamin uh, voice, but that was the second Fred and letter perfect that. He's like, so mine's a combination. And it's like the guy looks like David Spade. He's this little (laughs) twerpy guy. And he's doing this letter perfect Flintstone. And, no, I appreciate that. And knowing the history of animation through your father – um, what I, I just read a great book about the UPA 1950s. Yes. And yeah, I Gerald love Mc, that stuff. And that stuff is and, fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I picked up what I can. I, I never studied, oh, under, but yeah, the, the UPA stuff, that's actually one of his, that's one of his specialties. And, um, oh, there was a husband and wife team who worked at UPA or did a lot of stuff through UPA that he especially is a oh, fan. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I don't remember that from the book. Jay Ward, of course, <laughs> or like oh. we said before about, the subversion of My Little Pony. I mean, Rocky and Bullwinkle. And oh, I grew up the- watching that shit too. Yeah. Oh man, absolutely the best, the best it's classics, classics. Yeah. Yeah. There's there's a lot of and and the thing about having those really distinctive voices, bringing this background, the thing yeah. about having those really distinctive voices is that makes it the dialogue writing simultaneously a lot harder and a lot tougher because the Adventure Time not only had really distinctive voice actors but also just distinctive ways of phrasing and crafting sentences so, so every time i write dialogue i can i can just listen and be like okay can i hear you know john dimaggio or, or jeremy yeah, shot or, or, yeah, yeah, yeah yeah can i hear them saying it and that that immediately helps me try to figure this shit out so I yeah understand, man no so and that's it it's a much bigger challenge now to do that kind of licensed book than my childhood of the 70s when and i'm not knocking these things but charlton would get the Hanna Barbera license or mm. whatever and you know, I, I'd read a Flintstone comic book, and it was like, yeah, whatever. You know, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's just not that good. You know, yeah, it's so. it's kind of tossed off. And now, yeah, they have gotten really talented people. I mean, obviously, in the model yep. punch, you had Katie Cook and Andy Fleece, and, or had Andy Price and Tony Fleece. And yep. yeah, with the with like the Steven Universe comics, you got Melody Gilman, and with yes, and yeah, the the uh, the Adventure Time comics, they've got where well, they had you know, yeah, like we said, Ryan North and Kate Leth and everyone. Sure, Rick they've, and Morty too. Oh yeah, I mean, Rick, you know, uh, Kyle. Uh, oh God, now I'm blanking. On his name. Uh, blanking to Starks? Yes, uh, Kyle Starks. Thank yes. you. Yeah. And Teeny Howard. I just had Teeny on talking about her Rick and Morty stuff. Yeah. And I want to talk to uh, Jim Zub. Jim's doing Rick and oh, Morty yeah. versus Dungeons and Dragons. And I'm yeah, like, oh, that's, that looks, great. that's looking fun. <laughs> yeah, and, I, you know, and Jim gets it. I, I'm sure Jim's doing a good job. So, yeah. No, yeah. that's great, man. It's a good challenge. Yeah, and with Adventure Time also. So this is so I, I did the three-issue miniseries, and now they're actually going to be doing a season 11. Um, Fantastic! Like they're they're going to be doing a, like a future a, sure. you know, continuation of the show, basically. And for this first, so for the first four issues, uh, the story is written by um, Sunny Liu, uh, who did uh, yes. Art of Charlie Chan Hak Chai. Yeah, yes, indeed. And uh, I'm just I'm just a hatchet man. I'm just doing the script on it. But after that, there's eight issues that are all me, and it's boy oh boy, it's it is a daunting challenge because now there's no status quo. I can just do whatever the hell I can't do whatever the hell I want, but I can <laughs> I can change things up quite a bit. And it's it's suddenly being faced with like oh man, some people face every day. I get to make stuff up. <laughs> have, they, have they announced who your uh, artist is for the eight issues? Uh, it's uh, I I think I can say it's it's going to be the same artist I worked with on. Um, uh, beginning at the end, uh, Mari Julia um, or Mar Julia. I forget what they go by, but yeah, the, they're they're fantastic. Their stuff is also really tremendously great. Uh, they have, I mean, they match that that same manic energy, but they have a really, you know, they have a good emotional res. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? They, they they draw good. You know, that's I'm with you. <laughs> that's that's the important part of it. But well, yeah, and the other the other interesting thing I, I find with a lot of these uh, comic book adaptations of animation is they could put the camera in different places than the standard animation would allow them to do it. Mm-hmm. And I just actually had 
uh, Bill Morrison on, who obviously has done wonderful work on the Matt Groening cartoons from The Simpsons to Futurama and even the new Disenchanted on Netflix. Yes. He he adapted Yellow Submarine for for Titan. Oh, and and kept and kept the original design aesthetic for the book. But as I said, it's like he went back to 1968 and snuck a different camera crew. And while they were making the regular cartoon, he was shooting the same stuff from a different angle. Yeah, because and, and it's oh, great. I gotta look at that now because yeah, that that um, damn that 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 cartoon. When I imagine it, it's so two dimensional. I mean, it's two dimensional in the sense that they really are playing with the plane of it, but it's yeah, I, I'm having trouble yeah. imagining it in 3D. <laughs> I've got to see. No, this I'm shit with now. you exactly, and that and truly, that's what I found fascinating about it. And and again, I'm sure it was an ambitious challenge for him to retell the story. But take advantage of the fact that the comic book could do that much more oh. than what 1968 animation then could do. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm looking forward to working on this. It's gonna be it's gonna be crazy. That's awesome, man. Yeah. Very very cool. Yeah. So you got Adventure Time coming up. Moth and Whisper just getting started. The the five issue miniseries. Mm-hmm. Hopefully, will be more from AfterShock. Fingers crossed. And, and uh, and more pony work. More pony work. More pony work coming up definitely. And then I have I could talk about these. They've been announced, but they're also like a year or a year and a half away. So that's, you know, why, why, why waste talking about it now? But I've got, um, I'm doing a, uh, a graphic novel for graphic universe that the arm of learner publishing, I'm doing a YA book for them. Okay. Um, that's gonna be really fun. It's uh, it's about a teenage girl whose mom turns out to be a secret agent, and then so is she. She's got all these Manchurian candidate phrases programmed in her brain. So it's huh. a, yeah, it's a teen sort of spy family drama conflict comedy action thing that's gonna be a lot of fun sounds like chuck i've been rewatching chuck oh, on uh, amazon oh shit i gotta get into that too yeah i've watched <laughs> i went through and i watched like all the movies that have all the the brainwashing stuff you know i rewatched manchurian candidate i rewatched sure. uh what was that um charles bronson one it was a tv movie telephone God. telephone right? telephone yeah yeah oh yep. that one was weird yeah that's um, a cool movie <laughs> uh, you know i uh i now i gotta be honest i've yet to watch the re the remake of manchurian candidate i love the original yeah, I. <laughs> you know, there, there you, there I you've answered my question. I can't say much right. about it. No. <laughs> I understand. No, but you know, dude, that was the same thing with. Um, and I love Denzel. Same thing with Taking of Pelham One Two Three. Yeah, it's a classic. I always say it's like an R-rated episode of Barney Miller it's, from the seventies. It was it's so inappropriate. No, oh. it, it is. It, you're right. It's it's incredibly <laughs> funny, but it is, man. It is raw. And it's, it's like, yeah, do not expect a gentle hand to lead you into 1970s New York because it is in your face. It is racist. It is misogynist. <laughs> it is every ist you can think of that's wrong. But that was the tone of the city then, and it's it's very realistic for its time. Oh. And I think, again, it holds up because of that kind of you know look back at, well, no, this is kind of how it was. And like you say, no, it's a very good thriller. That's incredibly funny at the same time. Oh, that last shot of him reopening the door and poking his yes. head in and just yes. standing on that. Spoiler. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, crap. Spoilers. Yeah, for spoilers for a movie, what, 50 years old at this point? Exactly. Oh, yeah, at least. Yeah. At least. But, yeah, like fifty, like 40, probably like 45 years, almost 50. God. Hilarious. Yeah. I, but do, no, I, do. I, I, I love that I still haven't seen movie. the new one of that either. Yeah, no, but I can't imagine that it. Uh, well, yeah. I, Jeff Loeb and I were talking about it. He's like, you know, because he knows I love Walter Matthau. Oh, yeah. And I love those 70s Walter Matthau movies that were crime films. That and Charlie Varick and um, The Laughing Policeman, which is based on a great Swedish uh, thrill, police thriller. They're, oh, they're, it, it, it's so great because they're such atypical Matthau films that remind you the guy's a great actor. Yes, he's a great comedian, but he's still a great actor. And um, he's like, they're making... Pelham one two three. I'm like, who's making it? He's like, well, Tony St- Scott's directing. Who I like, good action yeah, director. Yeah, yeah. but, but again, it was Travolta. You know, it was Travolta and Denzel. It's just like the Flight of the Phoenix with Dennis Quaid. They're fine for they're chewing gum action movies. And yes, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But they miss the humor and the panache that the originals had. I mean, that Flight of the Phoenix. It's you know, fifty year old Jimmy Stewart and Fat Richard Attenborough. Those are your action <laughs> heroes. Well, what are we going to do, Charlie? The the plane's on the ground. You know, I mean, it's it, literally it's Jimmy Stewart being Jimmy Stewart trying to be an action hero. And the same with Matthau in these in these movies. And it's like it works because it's like they managed to keep the realism of their persona, their acting persona. And they the, again, they just they make it work. 
and oh, it's even yeah. that much more entertaining. I actually, I gotta say, I haven't seen Flight of the Phoenix. I, God, I haven't seen either of the Flight of the Phoenixes. I, I want to now, <laughs> though. I really want to. The, it's a, the original's fantastic. It really is a great movie. Yeah, the thing that actually makes me think of where it's a little bit of the actor getting to to riff off their persona. Um, uh, the surrogates, those mid two thousand. Oh sure, so was, yeah, yeah, yeah. Comic yeah adaptation. The, I love that because he's, he's walking around and he's robot cop Bruce Willis and he's you know nineteen nineties diehard Bruce Willis and he's and then he and then his <laughs> robot shorts out and he breaks down and he's old sagging. <laughs> exactly. Early, yes, agreed. Oh, and of course, uh, Bob Vene- uh, Vendetti, uh, based on a comic book. Oh, yeah, that, that I, I came in through the comic. And I'm like, wait, they're making a movie out of this? Yeah, yeah. Right. no, it's one of those forgotten comic book adaptations that it's like, yeah, actually, that's a really good movie. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, it's solid. I like the one. Yeah, no, I agree with you. Too funny, uh, Ted. Well, yeah. this has been great. Yeah. I, uh, again, congrats. Thank you so like- much. Oh, I should. Uh, oh, the other thing I'm also doing, I'm also doing a trilogy for Lion Forge, but that's, again, like a year and a half out. So, God, that's okay. so why I should talk about that. But- Another good imprint. Fantastic. Yeah. Oh, Lion Forge, I'm really happy to, to be hitching my wagon to them. They're doing a lot of new stuff, and they're expanding, and they're they're going in cool places. So, yeah. Um, I'm I'm moving out. I'm moving on. I'm I'm heading out. What am I looking for? No, you sound like Billy Joel. That's excellent. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, good. Just what I always wanted. <laughs> oh, boy. It's always good to get a barometer on. And I got to be honest, I turned the page on Billy Joel a long time ago as well. But it is kind of funny because I remember in, in sports radio, we were running a commercial uh, for a Sting concert. And this is like late 90s. So it wasn't that long. You know, he was still doing his solo albums. And this one young guy's like, oh, yeah, Sting. He was cool like 15 minutes ago. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, man, really? Sting? <laughs> Jesus, man, he was like my high school, like God. You oh, <laughs> bubble bursts. <laughs> That's all right. It ha- hey, man, we all turn the corner. We oh. all become Billy Joel in the end, and oh, he's a God. prime example, man. Short, shl- schlubby, bald Billy Joel still playing <laughs> piano, man. God bless him. He has the uh, advantage. You don't have to look at him when he's doing his great stuff, you know. Yeah. That's true. That's a very good, it's a very good point. Ted, it's been a pleasure, man. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much. Continued success, uh, Moth and Whisper from Aftershock Comics. Yeah. Issue one is out next Wednesday. September 12th. And then every month thereafter. Um, I'm also – I'm on the Twitter and the Tumblr and all that crap. I'm uh, Ted Lee Anderson, T-E-D-L-Y-A-N-D-E-R-S-O-N. If people want to follow me, I don't know why. Um, I still don't have a real website. I got to get that together at some point. But yeah, Moth and Whisper and then other stuff coming out. Very soon that I can't even talk about. So that's gonna be that's gonna be fun. Atta boy. Good chat, man. Pleasure meeting you and we'll do this again. Thank you so much. Ted Anderson, Moth and Whisper from Aftershock Comics. Check it out. Interesting book and an interesting creator. I look forward to having another conversation with Ted in the future. Coming up, Brad Meltzer, a great conversation. But first, this episode of Word Balloon brought to you by Aftershock Comics. Now, I'm sure you've seen Aftershock titles on the racks of your favorite comic stores. A whole slew of fresh, high concepts written and drawn by your favorite creators. How about the spy series Jimmy's Bastards from Garth Ennis and Russ Braun? There's Pestilence from Frank Thierry and Oleg Okunev, where the 14th century Black Plague from history is actually revealed as the first zombie outbreak, or the early years of Vlad the Impaler in The Brothers Dracul from Cullen Bunn and Mirko Kolak. These creators came to Aftershock to tell their kind of stories with no rules, just a new platform to tell great fresh concepts. Check out these new titles, like the Midwestern Noir Hot Lunch Special by Elliot Royale and Jorge Fornes. Current conspiracy theories with ties from centuries past in Beyonders, our buddy Paul Jenkins, and Wesley St. Clair. And a new series starring Leonardo da Vinci, his female apprentice Isabel, and their wooden robot, Monstro Mechanica, from Paul Aller and Chris Evenwees. The Collected Trade is out this month. In the weeks ahead, we'll be talking to more Aftershock creators, not only Ted, but about their books and uh, other stories as well. You don't have to wait, though. Check out full story descriptions, preview pages, and the diamond codes for these books to order through your local comic shop at AfterShotComics.com. All right. Without further ado, let's uh, talk to Brad Meltzer. I am thrilled every time he comes back. And uh, for a guy that I see so very rarely face to face, it's great having this long distance friendship. And as I say, I was inspired to have him on because on a Friday just a week ago, I happen to be watching C-SPAN 2, you know, dial twisting. And on book TV, there's Brad. 
And I'm like, oh, my God, that's right. He did The Escape Artist this year. Tremendous novel. The paperback comes out uh, this coming week. So there's another reason to talk to Brett. Plus, I am Neil Armstrong. And, man, like I said, I am a NASA freak. We talk about it. In fact, after talking to Brad, I found that old TBS documentary called Moonshot. The full thing is on YouTube. It's a three-hour documentary about uh, the Mercury program through the Apollo program. Amazing interviews with uh, the living astronauts at the time in the 90s. So Brad inspired that. But uh, it's also where I got my uh, one of my Neil Armstrong near-death stories. Brad tells a great one, and I am Neil Armstrong. But I mentioned one that wasn't in his book. But I, I'm amazed, and that Moonshot documentary has the footage that I'm talking about. So... Good conversation about astronauts, good conversation about comics with Brad Meltzer on today's Word Balloon. John. There he is. How are you, Brad? Hey, just uh, walking up to the office. Give me a moment. Let's, yeah, buddy. What's going on? I can talk to you as I walk. Attaboy. I yeah, good, because I wanted to BS with you for a second. I'm I'm watching some of this Kavanaugh stuff, the hearing, which is depressing as Watching well. the what? I couldn't hear what you said. Oh, the, the, the Judge Kavanaugh uh, Senate hearings? Oh, Kavanaugh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Bananas. I know, man, and I figured you you got better perspective than me in terms of, The you know. funny thing is, my first job, my first job ever in, um, in when I was an intern, eight, I was 18, 19, 19 years old. Okay. I worked for the Senate Judiciary Committee who does the hearings, um, <laughs> and my job was with a guy, a young senator at the time, but the guy who ran the committee, relatively new back then, but still senior enough to run the committee, was a guy named Joe Biden. Of course, yeah, yeah. And, and uh, so the whenever there's a Senate Judiciary Committee hearing, like, that's where I used to work. And I was there right, I forget if it was, I think it was right before or right after. I've just forgotten 20 years later. My memory's gone. But uh, when Bork happened, and I think it was right after Bork and right before whoever they replaced Bork with. Um, Wasn't it but that was like Wasn't it Clarence Thomas? I was going to say, it's Clarence, it was right Clarence Thomas, right? I think that's what it was. And, yeah. I mean, and the fun, the funny thing was is that, the last um, thing that happened, like my last day on the job, I, they said that we could sit behind the senator because it was a hearing of some sort, whatever it was. Sure. And so they, I just, I didn't, again, it just didn't use my brain. It was my last day on the job and I wanted to bring my girlfriend to go see how cool I was. <laughs> so I brought her in and, uh, and now, I, now I'm actually quiet so we can talk whenever you want to talk. But, okay. Um, but basically what happened was it, I brought my girlfriend in at the time to impress her. We were wearing like shorts and T-shirts and they sat. I didn't know where they were going to sit us. They just said we could go to see the hearing. They sat us right behind the senator. Oh, my and God. And so if you watched on C-SPAN, like my mother was like, why didn't you dress up? You know, like she was just like, what are you wearing? And I just and once you sit there, you can't move. You can't like there's nowhere to hide. <laughs> And so you're on at that point was the equivalent of national television for, you know, nerds, but it was great. That's awesome. Is this off the record? I mean, I asked off the record. Or yeah, 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 yeah. Because I would tell it, yeah, okay. as long as you can hear it. <laughs> Brad, you are like the smartest Forrest Gump I know. Well, that's the thing is, like, that's what my wife says to me. She's like, at what point did your life become Forrest Gump, right? Like, I mean... <laughs> And we were, and the thing that was so great is, we, you know, you like I married her. That that girlfriend, it actually worked. I think it might have impressed her, and that was the end of that I could offer her. Oh my god! All right, well, <laughs> I, I I was expecting a different sort of perspective on the hearings, but I thought that was a great story. It was so very good. That's a good way to start. Yeah. Welcome, Brad Meltzer. Welcome back to Word Balloon, man. Uh, thank you. Uh, I uh, I saw you. Uh, we're speaking of C-SPAN. I I saw you Friday, and I guess it was an old C-SPAN. It was from uh, the spring. A uh, book a book mm -hmm. signing that you did. Um, I forget where, but uh, yeah, they're doing a. Um, it was in. Uh, it was out in Virginia, and yeah, I just saw that they re-aired that. Which, um, I, you know, it's funny. I, you know, I, you do these things, and then C-SPAN puts them out, and you can tell who your friends are the nerdiest by who watches C-SPAN. <laughs> That's why I know who are my friends. So I know right there, that's why we're meant to be friends. I was so excited. I do. I check book TV every weekend. You know, hey, man, it's it's the same thing as a Comic-Con panel, basically. They really it's the are. exact same thing. All I do is, I, because it's C-SPAN, you know, my wife is like, put on a tie, jackass, you know, and that's it. That's the only difference. That's the, It's the same exact fit I would do at Comic-Con. And you get to see it recorded and on C-SPAN. And honestly, I encourage people to go to the C-SPAN website because they're amazing about archiving everything. 
And and I yeah, I will say they've done a great job. They've done a great job of. You know, listen, it used to be, I remember going and trying to see an author. I mean, now, obviously, we can all go to certain places and we know that, you know, whether it's Comic-Con or something else. But for authors, um, there are just places your favorite author is never going to come. Like, if, unless you live in a big city, book tours, are they're dying animals. Yeah. And so I love the fact that C-SPAN can take those big authors who don't tour anymore and just want to do one event or two events that are big at the 92nd Street Y, and boom, you know, you're on, and I love that. Absolutely, man. No, too funny. I, uh, I when, uh, when Gerald Ford, I think it was when he passed away, I had remembered at one of the 90s uh, GOP uh, conventions, probably 92, one of his last ones, um, he was on C-SPAN taking calls, and an Iranian gen- gentleman uh, asked him a question, and he had a very heavy accent. So he referred to himself as an Iranian uh, immig- or an Iranian, and I would like to ask about the Iranian e- economy. And of course, in classic Gerald Ford form, he's like, "I've been an onion eater forever," and he started going on about the onion agriculture business. And the C-SPAN person is like, uh, "Mr. President, I believe the gentleman was asking about the Iranian." Uh, economy. He's like, oh, Iran. Well, <laughs> without no, no problem. I can talk about that as well. And it was just this classic Gerald Ford thing. And I was on sports radio then when he passed away. And I'm like, oh, I remember this classic Ford, you know, gaffe that I'm sure. Nobody and this knows. man was the president. This man was a president of the United States, went to my alma mater, the Genius. University of Michigan. And you basically summed his life up by taking in that moment a clip on uh, upon his death and saying he missed up the guy for Iranian. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I know. I'm an asshole. You're right. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's just me giving you crap. No, of course it is. It's all good. Hey, man, I would hope so after 10 years of conversation, certainly. No, no. Yeah, all no. right, now let's get on with you. Uh, I am Neil Armstrong. Fantastic. Is it already out? Uh, it is officially out today. We are super excited. Um and I mentioned this before, but it bears repeating, but this was Chris Eliopoulos' dream book. Um, when we first started doing the series, we launched with I'm Amelia Earhart and I am Abraham Lincoln, but Chris Eliopoulos never wanted to do Abraham Lincoln. He was like, I want to do Neil Armstrong. And I was like, why? And he's, I'm like, because you think he's amazing? Because you think he's like incredible? And he was like, because I want to draw outer space. Yay. And I was like, you you're so nerdy, right? Like so awesome. And, and the fun of the book for me, and I, you know, this part I've said, but um, is, you know, we give the book when you're done with it, you got to give it to the people who know. So we gave it to a guy who was a NASA pilot. We gave it to one of, you know, the big biographers who did one of the big Armstrong books. And, you know, the NASA guy was like, you know, Chris drew every rivet on every rocket. I have like every <laughs> single thing that the Apollo, like step one, step two, step three, step three and a half, like, I got every, I was like so into it. I was just full on. And the NASA people were like, um, yeah, we read the book. We're like, what did you think? And they were like, you guys are nerds. And and when NASA calls you a nerd, you know, you know, you're in good shape. Absolutely. Well, hey, man, we all grew up during that wonderful period. And I'm a little older than you guys. And I, I, I was four years old when the moon landing happened. And, you know, you remember the moon landing? I truly do, because my grandfather and father were smart enough to point me to the TV and say, this is important. Do you see the moon? These guys are up there. And they would point to the moon and then point to TV. And I'd see Aldrin yeah. and, and Armstrong. So, yeah, no, I got it. And again, also. Oh, uh, yeah. See, I wasn't. I wasn't. I, this is where I'm I, now. I feel really. I wasn't born when it happened. I have no, no you know, obviously. And so, you know, I love the fact that I didn't realize that uh, you were actually at four years old. That would have been like so mind blowing that you would have just been like, we're all going. And you're probably pissed right now that we're not there. Brad, I say it all the time. I love the fact that we have the supercomputers, but between uh, the the TV fiction of the 60s and 70s and the realities of NASA, I wanted a jetpack. And I really figured by my 50s, I would have a jetpack. And I figured I'd deal with did you see, did you see? Did you see the guy? Did you, there is a guy who has a jetpack right now. Did yes, you see the, I'm not joking. Did you see it? <laughs> I have. There's one guy in London. They did that bit, and it's pretty badass. Yeah. I mean, it's not like it's not Rocketeer, but it's it's darn it, it's something. It, it is not nothing. It's not one of those like water ones. It's like a guy flying through the streets of London, and you know, every every one will be blown on their ass. But it's awesome. Yeah, man. Well, you know, and again, um, Thunderball, the movie Thunderball, and uh, 
God, a million college and, and pro football halftimes, they would have jetpack demonstrations. Yeah, and, and, yeah, but they were you, yeah. Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. I'm like, all right, fine. By the t- and literally, my and I'm sure as I got older, I'm like, all right, probably like by the time I'm a middle aged man, I'll, I'll have a jetpack, and here I am, and I, I don't. Have no, a jetpack, and I'm man. and I'm listen. I'm still pissed. <laughs> at, forget jetpack. I want full flying car. Like for me with the Jetsons, right? It was like the <laughs> Jetsons. I want a car, and I want it to fold it in my briefcase, and I push a button. And this boy Elroy, dun, 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 and boom, and that's what I wanted, man. I wanted to just go to school like that. Well, I'll tell you, uh, uh, Chris did a great job drawing, and I do intend to talk to Chris either before or after uh, New York Comic Con because he really outdid himself. And it's it's always great to see people of Chris's style or a Mike Oming or somebody like that really do outer space. And he, he does it yeah. justice. He really does it justice. And you know, I'll let you tell, there's a great, like, space moment that really happened, and you guys give it extra attention. Yeah, no, no, and let's go through, because it's just bears. You know, Neil Armstrong right now, we live in a time where, you know, listen, this is a book. When, when we start the books, I don't know what the moral lesson is going to be. I don't know what I'm going to pull from their lives. I have general ideas, but I knew Neil Armstrong, because I put him... In another book I'd done research on, and and you just look at where our leaders are today. I don't care what your politics are, wherever you are on the on the political spectrum, but you know this is a leader who never used the word I, and just always used the word we. Yeah. We did this. This is we made this accomplishment, um, and it was just humble. It was a guy in the right place at the right time, and you know could have been, and it was at that point the most famous man in the world, but could have easily sold everything. You know we could be eating at you know. Instead of Burger King, there would be an Armstrong's, and we could be eating there, and he'd sold his soul. And they, they picked him for that reason, because he was never going to do that. And so to me, when, you know, remember when, when humility was a great American virtue? Yeah. Like, we've lost that. Remember when our leaders didn't say, I, 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 and just, you know, that's gone. And, you know, these books are our way of trying to bring it back. And, and I think for us, especially the, the, the nerdy side of our brains, um, is we really wanted to teach kids what engineering was, you know, it's sure. just like, that's what, you know, what engineering is. And I'm not talking about taking out a, a compass and, and, you know, a square and doing calculations, but, you know, engineering is figuring out a solution. That's how you engineer something. You figure it out. Um, and I love the fact when Neil Armstrong was a little kid, his like big dream was to climb this giant silver maple tree that was the biggest one in his backyard. <laughs> and, you know, it seemed impossible. This tree was huge, and he was just a little kid. He's like eight years old. And But he has to, what does he have to do? He has to take the first step, right? Like, you climb a tree, it's like a puzzle. Yep. you got to pick the right branches. you got to use your brain more than your body. you got to, you know, get used to feeling so high. And he, and he gets his hand all the way up on one of the branches, and it snaps. It's a dead branch, and it snaps. And he falls 15 feet straight down on his back. And, you know, his sister comes running. He's like, should I get mom? And, you know, he's like, yes. You know, like you just said, that, that when the yes. wind is knocked out of you. Yeah. Um, right? And he, and he says he, he learned that day you don't grab dead branches. But the best thing that I'm, you know, I wrote it to teach my kids. And I think I need myself every day is that when that was over, he got back up again. Right. Like yeah. there's the friggin lesson, man. We all need it. It's like Batman himself. You know, you're going to fail. You know, you're going to fail, but you still keep going. You still keep doing it. Um, and, I, and I love that we get to kind of feature a story like that. Agreed. And then, I mean, these guys, obviously, a lot of them were test pilots and that kind of thinking, uh, you know, spur of the moment saved his life several times. Now, you depict one of those major moments in his uh, Gemini mission where uh, they're docking for the first time and it's a classic story, yeah. you know, and then, and they, yeah. So do, let's go through it. Yeah. Let's it. talk about it. I mean, so it, yeah, no. So he's basically uh Gemini eight and the goal is to fly alongside and dock with another spacecraft. So that both spacecraft are kind of like linked together. And at that point it was the first time two spacecraft ever were actually connected in outer space. Right. And everyone starts celebrating and they're all cheering. They dock. It's awesome. And then they undock again and they're suddenly spinning out of control. And they're like, Gemini, you okay? What's wrong? And they're tumbling end over end. Like, just imagine, like, kind of that Apollo capsule that you see kind of returning. Just it is over and over and spinning and spinning. 
And there was one, there was a short circuit, I believe, one of the thrusters. And, yeah. and Armstrong realizes if you don't stop, if we can't stop spinning here, that the force is going to tear the ship apart. And basically, he keeps his eye on the controls. And, and the key thing he has is, it was, you know, Neil Armstrong had one superpower. It's called keeping calm. Yep. And he keeps his eye on the controls so he can fire another thruster to kind of counteract the spin. And obviously, the mission had to be stopped earlier than was planned, but they actually land safely. And it's that moment that he learns, to me, the best lesson of all is, like, nothing in outer space is easy. It will kick your ass, right? And yeah. and that is, you know, we all say today, oh, my gosh, he went on the moon. He took a step out. It's so easy. And that's the that's the kind of BS version that we sell our kids and we do an injustice to the person, to our kids and our nieces and nephews, because it's not easy. It's friggin' hard. You, you know, the first Apollo, like that mission was with, you know, Gus Grissom and white and Roger Chaffee. Yep, I mean, these yep. guys were killed. They're killed because there's a fire from a frayed wire. And, you know, the, the Soviet union cosmonauts, they lost, uh, astronauts too. Yes. And this thing was like an impossibility. You know, the, we right now on our phones have more computing power than the Apollo uh, entire rocket had, right? Like, just think about that a moment. And it wasn't like the, it wasn't computing power that they had. It was just math and ingenuity and, and figuring out like, you know, what, what a thruster does in space to figure out the calculation to let gravity take its course and bring you back and momentum to bring you back. And I love that you know, you teach your kids, it was hard. You're going to get your butt kicked. But again, that first lesson from the tree, get back up again, man. Agreed. And uh, again, like you said about the uh, Gemini 8 mission, um, not only could the spaceship tear apart, but to even uh, have uh, the ability to control and get get control back, because as they were spinning, he could have thrown up. He could have lost consciousness. I mean, it was that kind of dangerous thing. And yet, he right, or he could do it right. And he could, and he could do what we would all do, friggin' panic. Yeah, shit, right? Pants. Like, yeah, forget about just like, like, listen, okay, fine. They gave him the test that he's not going to vomit. They gave him the test that he's, you know, like they put you in the black room and he figures out, like, what, how much time passes because he can measure a song. Yes. He's like, you know, he's, he's kind of, he can, he's pretty ingenuitive about those things. But, but the badass thing about him is, like, when my rocket ship is, like, hurtling back to Earth end over end, I'm just like, oh, crap. My rocket ship is hurtling end over end back to Earth. Panic, baby. And the man is just cool, right? Yeah. He just yeah. keeps calm and is like, oh, I know. I'm going to do this thruster. You know, and, and again, those are the details that even me as an adult, like, you know, with each of these books, I always joke that they're for kids, but they're not. They're for us. Yeah. Like, they're the things that I basically, people are like, how do you know what stories to put in there? I'm like, what are you kidding? I don't run them for my, you know, my little kids. I'm like, I just think, what do I think is cool? And these are the cool parts. This is the best part of Neil Armstrong. Agreed. You know, did you know about the um, when they were uh, testing the lunar module? It wasn't the actual module, but they had a thing called the flying carpet, I think, where it was a platform with rocket engines underneath it. And it was to simulate uh, the capsule landing on the moon and, you know, just kind of uh, slowly with thrusters trying to p do a pinpoint landing. Well, he had a problem with that. Yeah, well, that. the thing is. Yeah, no, I mean, that's the thing is, like, when they were, when they're looking for their landing spot, like, people think, like, oh, again, you come out and, and you can simulate all you want down low, but the rocks on the moon were as big as, like, you know, they're like minivans, you know, they're like cars out there. The ground's not smooth, like we see in that one image of, you know, that we all know is like, oh, you're walking around, there's dust flying, but he has no idea. Like, you know, they, when they say that he's ready to go for power descent, like their radar, their instruments, none of it was really accurate, right? Again, they didn't have the <laughs> stuff that we have now. Right. The capsule had no idea that one of the guys that I spoke to who worked on one of the NASA books, they had no idea how high they were. Like they didn't have you know, those instruments that we have today. And he had to use a stopwatch and quick math to figure it out. Like, let me just, again, <laughs> let's just pause a moment. A stopwatch and quick math. That is a recipe for my death. No right? kidding. Man. Like that's all I got. And, and in fact, when we were researching it, um, you know, they, they weren't close to the landing spot at all. And again, using his superpower, Neil Armstrong never panicked. The guy who wrote uh, one of the big NASA books told me that they had less than a minute of fuel left. Yes. That's it. Yes. Le less than a minute of fuel. And he's trying to land this thing on a dime. And 
this is the moment, you know, where all of it comes together, right? That's what he trains for. And rather than panicking, he just like uses the math, uses the stopwatch, figures it out, and boom, that, you know, the landing's so soft, they barely feel it. Badass. Total bad. And now the story. Right? I, was, I mean, come on. The story I was wondering if you knew about, it's not in it's not in your book, but I saw it and read it in Deke Slayton's book, Moonshot. And I remember seeing it on the, the film documentary as well. They're testing this thing called the flying carpet. The, it's the proto. It's a, an earthbound simulation of the lunar module. And they're and they're doing the same thing. They're simulating kind of using retro rockets to touch down land. Well, he has an engine failure. And the thing explodes. But luckily, he's able to hit his ejector. And there literally is film of him ejecting. And you see him, I don't know how many feet away from the explosion, but they, had, they caught it all on film. So that's another time Daniel Armstrong could have killed himself. But again, his smarts kept him alive. He knew exactly what to do. I mean, that's steely-eyed missile man, as they say in Apollo 13. And absolutely, that's that's what these guys were. And you forget that. And especially, no, no disrespect meant to the current breed of astronauts. But like you said, there was no blueprint of how to do this. So it was them or nothing. And the Soviets, like you said, had a lot of failed er errors on their part. And Neil Armstrong was just this exceptional pilot and hero and, and just able to work under extreme circumstances and yeah there's there's several versions of why. why right but the thing that i you know what i admire is like you know we again we always want to turn these guys into like these mythical heroes we like dip them in concrete and make statues of them and we just again do this disservice because neil armstrong isn't like you know let's uh, take nothing away from them but he's he he's born just like the rest of us sure. you know like he's afraid when he when he's little he's afraid of santa claus you know, he's like, he's not the brave kid. Like, Santa Claus terrifies him. And, and, you know, and he loves to read. So he's just like all of us. Anyone listening to this podcast, right? We're all these kids who used to love to read. Yep. Um, and, and, you know, he was just a patient kid. Like, his brother used to kick the Monopoly game over when he would get pissed off. And Neil Armstrong would just be chill as can be. But I love that it's like that kid that gets the chance, right? It's like he's, yes. not, he's not perfect in every way. And sure. I love that he's the one in all those kind of crazy skills, except for probably the Santa Claus one, but they come together and give us something amazing. Well, and like you said, that makes it more relatable to kids. They all can relate. I mean, you know, wasn't it Lincoln with turtles? Wasn't that your one of your uh, big things with Lincoln? Always. Yeah. And Always. I <laughs> Listen, that's it. I mean, that, that's the thing you need to, but that's the story my son still loves, right? Abraham sure. Lincoln seeing that a group of boys are torturing turtles one day. And he races over. He thinks they're playing with turtles. They're putting hot coals on the backs of the turtles, and they're torturing them. And Abraham Lincoln's like, what are you doing? And, and he sees what they're doing, and he's like, take the coal off the turtles. And, I, again, I don't care if you're 10 years old or you're 50 years old. Sometimes it's hard to do the right thing, yeah. but someone has to. Yep. Um, and, you know, whether, and, and my son still sleeps with a little Abraham Lincoln doll because he loves that friggin' story of the turtles. He doesn't care that Lincoln was president. He doesn't care. You know, he has no point of reference to him in the Civil War. But, man, he was friggin' nice to those little turtles and, and stood up for some, someone that needed it. That's the beauty of these books, Brad. You guys always find these interesting little nuggets, and you put them in there. And I, I'm really thrilled that you guys have had such success with this series. Absolutely deserved. Every library and school uh, should be carrying these, and uh, I'm glad that you're out there touring on on the strength of these and and keeping people aware. Didn't you just do a book expo this weekend? We talked about the one in Virginia you were at, but uh... yeah, no, I was just at the National Book Festival yeah. in Washington D.C., which was really fun because you know we have brought the next book in the series is Sonia Sotomayor. Oh, fantastic! And at this at the event with you know at the same event was Sonia Sotomayor, and I was just like, that's just craziness. I mean, that's when you're just like. Okay, you know, like don't screw it up. <laughs> How many people that you've done biographies on have have seen the book? Because I know a lot of them obviously have since passed. Amelia Earhart, even Lucille Ball, and you know people like that. So yeah, how many of the yeah livings? we've only we've only done three living ones. So we did Jane Goodall, and Jane Goodall helped us with the book. Uh, Sonia Sotomayor, we sent it to her office, and they were very nice to us. She obviously can't weigh in on anything because you know you never she can't endorse products or anything like well, that. Sure, but just sure. you know. We were so great. And then uh, the so we do because um, I really want to do a Latina because my my family, my sister in law is Latina. And she's like, listen, I need someone for my niece and nephew. You better get your ass right. Melter. That's awesome. Um, and, <laughs> and so we did that. And then the next one we're doing is actually in February. 
we're doing Billie Jean King. And I just was Yay. able, uh, I just, I, Billie Jean King got on the phone with me for an hour to go through the book that I wrote about her. And I was like, um, is it weird to see yourself as a little cartoon girl? And she's like, yep, pretty weird. Um, so it was just great. <laughs> she's amazing. I, I had the pleasure in my sports radio days and she's everything she should be another hero and absolutely like very cool, very down to earth, funny lady. And uh, incredibly accomplished, and I and truly, I'm so glad that she's getting the recognition she deserves in her lifetime. And so that's that's fantastic. I want I am Kareem Abdul Jabbar. That's your one, huh? He's the man, right? I mean, the think pieces that the guy's putting out, um, good stuff. But I yeah. I tend to not my my actual gut is I don't do anyone who's alive, okay? Unless I because you you're always like one bad day away from screwing it all up. Right. I hear you. Well, yeah, um, yeah I am and, Bill Cosby. So I got Could have been I a disaster. To, yeah. Die. Yeah. Right. Right. If I do Bill Cosby, like in fact, when I was doing Heroes for My Son, I have a copy of this. We had a proof copy. I'm proofing the book. The proof copy has this one page. That at the last second, I just said, you know, I got a bad feeling. This is ten years ago, wow. before anything bad had happened, and I'm I'm going through the book, and they said, oh, who do who, what, what are you feeling about? And I said, I don't know. This guy Neil Armstrong. Uh, this guy uh, Lance Armstrong. I just, I got a feeling and I pulled the Lance Armstrong page out of the book Wow! and, you know, just, I, it had, the story hadn't broken yet, but I just had this like, you know, it's kind of like this could go wrong. And, uh, and so I, I tend to, you know, anyone that we've picked is either, you know, you gotta be on the older side or, or have me convinced you're not going to screw it up. See, you got good spider sense. That's good, man. That's one of your superpowers. Very good. Trust your spider sense, man. <laughs> Now I, you know, we should. Uh, you, I, you mentioned to me uh, as we were arranging this that you wanted to talk a little bit about not only comic books, obviously. I should give it up to you, by the way. Nice uh, little vignette in Action One Thousand with John Cassidy. Oh uh, yeah, with Cassidy. So let me tell you what happened. So here's yeah. the story behind that story. So you know, the story is very simple in it. Um, you know, it's these little five-page vignettes, and mine was about Superman racing. Uh, it opens with him saying, I'm not going to make it. And, and what happens is, is there's a guy who has a gun to a woman's head and he's already pulled the trigger and it Superman's racing to stop this bullet as it comes through the chamber. And he, you know, he can see, he's like, I can see how far he is. I know my top speed. I know the distance is just math. I'm not going to make it. And he's like, but I got to try. And, you, you know, you turn the page and he's flying. It's, you know, hypersonic becomes supersonic becomes that speed that he went when, you know, when, when Pa died and he's flying toward this woman. And just as he gets to the woman, um, he's like, I'm so focused on the guy who pulled the trigger. He doesn't see her. And what she does is she kind of leans and pushes her head toward the barrel. And all it does is like move the gun, like, you know, a a half an inch, you know, she's still going to take a bullet in the head. He's like, but it's just enough to buy her a split second because the guy freaks out and pulls out a little bit. (laughs) And, and it's just enough to buy her this kind of picosecond, and he, and, and he comes bursting through the wall, and he grabs the bullet, and he says, just enough time for him to save the day. And so he says, when you get to the last page, you know, great job. Um, you know, you're very brave of you. And, and the woman says, Lila. And he says, that was very brave of you, Lila. You should think about being a cop. And he says, you know, my dad says that. He says, all of us are here for a reason, which is my favorite line from the Superman movie. Absolutely. But what no one knew at the when no one knew at the time is Lila, the girl who's in the story, is my daughter. Oh, that's and great. what I had, and so everyone saw this Superman story that was you know for Christopher Reeve and honored Action Comics one thousand. For me, it was actually just a message to my daughter. And so I had John Cassidy take pictures of my daughter, draw her as an adult because she's just a little girl right now. Um, and and so I took I, I got the original art, bought it from John. Um, who was kind of, of course, gave me the big splash page, and I took bought the extra pages. And then I had Chris Eliopoulos, the amazing artist, and also our letterer on that book. Um, I had him re-letter the original art with, like, the old school, like, you know, where you, where you put the lettering onto the real art so my daughter would have this present forever. And oh, that's, so that's great. The real, uh, real fun, nerdy stuff behind it. Yeah, but again, it's always these people that can sum up Sp- Superman eloquently in a very brief moment. And I loved the final panel, or I should say next to the final panel, there's an off-screen conversation with Clark and Lois. And Lois says... Uh, it's my favorite part of the whole story. There you yeah. go, man. So he it's says, your words if says, you want to say it. No, he says, he says to, uh, you know, he sees, he's, Lois reads the smile on his face and says, you met a good one today, didn't you? And yep. he says, I meet a good one every day. 
And that's the point of the story. There's Superman right there in that exchange. But also what Lois says, and that is people think you inspire them. What they don't know is all these people inspire you. And they say, exactly, yeah, man, that's, that's, that's the key. There you go. I mean, honestly, I love that. Rucka, when he says, you know, you can't, you can't you know, hurt Superman with a bullet, but you could break his heart. And it's those kinds oh, of yeah. moments that reminds you why Superman in the right hands works because – it's always these creators that you know, I don't know what I don't know what to do with Superman, and it's like okay, that's fair, but you you haven't really sat down with him. Like he's too powerful, he's too this, and it's like ah, there's there's a human being all under there, and it's it's that great um, debate. I was lucky enough to have dinner with Mark Miller with a group of people at C two E two, and Mark thinks he's Kal El first and foremost. He's the Kryptonian all, at all times. He was raised by humans, but he's like that's like Tarzan being raised by the apes. They can only teach you so much, but really your, your mind is more evolved than theirs are. And he even said a colony of ants uh, with a human being. And I'm like, I don't know, man. I still say he's Clark. And I think all of his humanity makes him who he is. And, I, you know, and again, I, I have no problem with – it's a fair debate. It's an interesting debate. Is he Kryptonian? Oh, is no. He, I, think, Cal, yeah, man, is I, I First of all, I think Mark totally gets the character, but of I, I of course, completely disagree. I, I think yeah. if you don't land with the <laughs> Kent and Kent, you know, the only, every – if you again look at the history of comics, after Superman sold a million copies, everyone came out with a Superman ripoff. They had yep. people who could fly, they had people with capes, they had people who could bend steel, but none of them were Superman. And the reason none of them were Superman is because none of them had Clark Kent. That's the reason they couldn't be, could, they couldn't reproduce it, is because he was this human being raised by us. He, it, you know, just giving a guy superpowers and letting him fly is not what makes Superman. What makes Superman is the fact that he's, you know, he's born with those values, if not born with, but taught those values by where he, where he winds up growing up. And to me, that's, you know, the mo I always say, but I'll say it again, the most important part of the story is not Superman. The most important part of the story is Clark Kent, because yep. we're all Clark Kent. Yep. And we all know what it's like to be boring and ordinary and wish we could do something incredible beyond ourselves. That's the appeal. Well, and again, that's what you said about uh, Jerry Siegel as well. And I know, uh, your, the Book of Lies, right? Isn't that the one that uh, had? Yeah, uh, no. Uh, I wrote. Listen, I wrote. I spent a. I met one of my. You know, I've, I've met presidents and senators and congressmen, and Supreme Court justices. But the scariest interview I've ever done in my whole life is I got to talk to and interview the real life Lois Lane, which was uh, Joanne Siegel, Jerry Siegel's wife, who they based Lois Lane on, um, and listening to her talk about her husband, and talking to Jerry Siegel and you know their daughter, who I've become friends with over the years, you know, and she's a dear friend. Um, but to hear these stories and, and, you know, these guys were just, you know, I always say, but they weren't powerful and they weren't good looking and they weren't cool in school, but it was these two 17 year old kids that gave us Superman. And I, I like to think it's because they put themselves in it, right? It was that nerdy thing, that wish fulfillment, that thing we all wish we could be. Uh, and to me, I think, you know, and I've talked to Brian about this privately, you know, um, as well as publicly, but I think Ben, this is so beautifully dealing with this kind of, uh, as he took on Superman, it is just breathtaking to watch someone who has just a keen understanding of that human side of him and what's hurting him week in, week out, as you're reading, you know, if you're reading the books, you know, which are coming out on this great bi-weekly basis now, but is, you know, the best things that hurt Superman are the things that hit him in the heart, you yeah. know, not, yeah. not bullets that is, you know, th those, those are, He's having great fun with those moments and people shooting at him and, you know, but man, it's those things that are hitting him personally that are, that are doing the most damage. And that's because that's the human side. Agreed. No, it's uh, the book is in good hands. And uh, again, it's always fun to have you revisit him. And I'm glad you were able to do that even in five pages in uh, Action 1000. That's great. And, um, you know, uh, now Escape Artist is, is obviously has been out there for several months now. And uh, yeah, out in paperback next week. Oh, fantastic, man. Hey, that's great. Excellent. Yep. I didn't realize that. All right. Good timing for that then. So yeah, elevated so pitch. Do for... not buy. Listen, do not buy it in full price right now. Wait like 10 days. It's coming out in paperback. Get it cheap. Uh, as someone who can never afford hardback books, and I never could, I didn't buy my first hardback book until I was done with college because we just you know, couldn't afford them. Sure. Um, paperback, <laughs> paperback's fun, man. Get a deal. I'm with you. Absolutely. And I did the same thing when I was a kid. Man, I, it bums me out um, where books are right now because – Luckily, Chicago is a great uh, book-selling city, not only uh, great chains, but also independent bookstores still. Um, but, man, I'll tell you, also great used bookstores. And two of my favorite bookstores that are used stores, they just couldn't come up, keep up with the, uh, the real estate prices in their neighborhoods. And they had to close. And, it, uh, I mean, you know, sucks. again, thankfully, yeah. we still have plenty here that I can 
peruse, but no, it was like you know, as I'm sure it's it's the same in your cities. You know, where it's the, like, but even though even the Barnes and Noble in my hometown closed. There's yeah, I'm always no nervous about that too. Yeah, I, I have more comic stores actually that are closer to me than bookstores right now. Yep, understood. I, and even I and my original comic store, the original comic store that I went to in Miami, actually closed about ten days ago, and I got word that it was closed. I mean, that was where I bought. You know, Judas Contract, the annual. It's where I bought, you know, the last issues of Watchmen. When you know, I, I was <laughs> living in New York and Brooklyn growing up, but when I came to Florida, was you know, was where I got the ends of a lot of these stories. And Teen Titans was actually was uh, coming out first at the time, right as I moved, and and the annual came out, and I, you know, that changed my life. That book, and here was a store closing, and I went there on the on the final day just to give a hug to the owner and say, listen, man, thank you, but. It wasn't because he was old and it wasn't because he was tired. He was just couldn't keep up in the business anymore. It was just too hard. And that was heartbreaking to me. Yeah. Now I understand, man. I um, now mentioning all that. And it, it makes me think, especially with Teen Titans, the new Titan series, DC Universe, the new streaming service and stuff, your involvement in television. Would you was it would there ever be a time? Because obviously we've got the CW shows. And you're a TV writer. You've been a TV writer before. Jack and Bobby, certainly. Um, would you ever consider like trying to do? A superhero teleplay? Yeah, you know, you know, I just went out. I took my family. We all went uh, on an Alaskan cruise uh, wow. two weeks ago. We got back from, and it was great cruise, whatever. And we had a wonderful time. But the cruise left from Vancouver, and so my buddy Mark Guggenheim, uh, who you know up until this year ran Arrow, yes. Legends of Tomorrow, obviously, and you know, dear friend Jeff Johns, who I love, you know. My oldest friend in comics, beside Judd, who I went to college with, you know, but yeah. my, like I love these guys. Sure. And and I was I was like I'm in Vancouver, you know. Mark was like, if you get there, let us know. And so I wound up going to the set of The Flash and went to the set of Arrow and to Legends. I took my daughter over to Riverdale because she <laughs> needed something too. And I love those guys. I love all of them. They're sweeties can be. I know the director who directed that episode is a dear friend. Um, you know, we have mutual friends. And Wendy Miracle, who, you know, ran Arrow last year, it sure. was on Jack and Bobby with us. Um, so oh. I, I would love to do those things. I just physically don't have the time, is the honest truth. It's just that, like, you know, I'm between the kids. You know, I used to do a thriller every two years. Yeah. But now we're doing Neil Armstrong that comes out today. We have I Am Sonia Sotomayor comes out in November. We have in February I Am Billie Jean King. And in January we have our first nonfiction adult book, about a secret plot to kill George Washington. Yes, indeed. I found. I'm glad you mentioned it. And that. it's just crazy story. And so that's four books in six months. So I would love to do one of those shows and do something like that, but I just don't have the physical time to do it anymore. I hear you, man. Talk about that Washington book. You mentioned it on your uh, C-SPAN speech, and I uh, no, it's very intriguing. And, and yeah, it's, uh, it's a great story about uh, colonial espionage, if you will. Yeah, no, what happens is, is George Washington, uh, it's, it's really the height of the Revolutionary War is about to start. We're in, you know, 1776. You can't plan it any better than that. It's, you know, it's, it's late June, beginning of July, 1776, right? It's the high point of it all. And uh, George Washington finds out about a secret plot. Some say to assassinate him, some say to kill him. They wanted to you know, kidnap him. They didn't know. But it, it, the result was always the same as you die. Right. And when he finds out about it, he takes one of the main people who's involved with it builds a gallows, hangs him in front of 20,000 troops and bystanders. It's at that point, the largest public execution at that point in North American history, George Washington brings the hammer down is like, do not mess with me. I'm George Washington. <laughs> um, and you know, it was just, it's an incredible moment of history, but I'm like, why do I not know about that? Yeah. Why does almost nobody know about that? And you'll see it in every book like written about the time. It'll get a paragraph or it'll get a footnote somewhere. I found it in a footnote, but no one's written a book on it. <laughs> no, I couldn't find a single modern book written about this subject. And I was like, are you guys crazy? This is the coolest thing out there. And we wound up uh, myself and a guy named Josh Mensch, who was the executive producer on Lost History, just went digging. And it's called The First Conspiracy. Uh, it truly is the first conspiracy. It's, the country is being built and this is it. And it's called uh, The First Conspiracy, The Secret Plot to Kill George Washington. And you also see it's the birth of the counterintelligence movement. It's where George Washington learns you got to fight back. 
Wow. And so, you know, we think the OSS is the first. It's not. It's 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 this committee on conspiracies that George Washington launches. That's and amazing. It's, it's just amazing. So, yeah, man. <laughs> obviously, I, I love to write the flash and Grant, Grant Gustin couldn't be nicer to me and my kids. Um, so I would kill to work with him because he's such a sweetheart. But I, I got to, you know, George Washington wins on this one. Yeah, I love to see with the father of our country. Sorry, Flash. All right. I, I think I think Barry Allen would understand. That's OK. You made the right choice. Brad, that's what I love about you, man. You find these amazing stories and you've been doing it in your books. You're doing it on television. Um, you hinted there might be a new television project. Uh, any news on that or is it still in development or any? Uh, can you tell us soon. I'll say soon. Stay okay. tuned. All right. I yeah, you'll come back. Come, come follow on social media. Yeah, we'll, we'll announce when we can announce. All right, no problem, man. And I know you wanted to talk comic books with me as well. And also, um, you are no longer, you know, the only guy in the locker room that uh, is a novelist and a, and a comic book guy. And uh, I, I've wondered about uh, any interactions you've had with uh, my buddy Tom King, Charles Soule, some of these others that uh, have, you know, feed in both worlds as you do. Yeah, and listen, I, you know, I think one of my favorite things about comics, even more than the novel world, is um, there's just a real feeling of community. Yep. There just is. So I, you know, Tom King is a sweetheart. So is Charles. Um, you know, when I started, Kevin Smith was, I remember, you know, was, Kevin was the only one doing it at the time, right? Like they had, you, you'd have things where like, you know, you get the screenwriter from the original Batman movie. Sam Hamm was doing an yes. issue of like detective comics, right? Yes, and you were the annual and you were just like, right. Remember the Batman annual and you were like, Oh man, he's in, but you know, it, it really wasn't a thing until Kevin Smith came in Absolutely. and Kevin came in. He was the first man through the door that was regularly there doing something else, become the comics. And I was just a dummy who was second because Kevin was leaving the book and Bob Shrek said, Hey man, we got. We don't want to give it to a regular comics writer. It's our number one selling superhero book. Um, if we give it to you, no one knows who you are. But they'll be like, "Why'd they take their number one book and give it to a novelist?" <laughs> and so you'll. They, they say, "Hey, Bob said to me, you'll succeed on a big stage. You're going to fail on a big stage, but it's yours to do." And I was like, "I'll take that chance any day." And, and I, I, the reason I tell the story is because Kevin could have been like, "I'm out," and you know, screw you all, whatever's left. And he did the nicest thing I'd ever seen which was he said he, they did a press release announcing my arrival and he put a quote in it that said, I'm staying on this book and I hope you'll stay too. And that That's just excellent. blew me away. Yeah. That was just so friggin' nice. Um, and everyone stayed for issue 16 where I came on and our numbers stayed pretty solid. And then it was up to me to like fail or you succeed. And so, you know, when Tom King came around, when Charles came around, anyone who comes around, um, I always try to reach out to them and say, how can I help you? What do you need? You want to talk about, you know, novels or comics? And inevitably, some of them will just approach me and say, you know, hey, I wrote novels, too. You want to talk about it? So I love these guys. I think Tom's Batman is the best Batman I've read in, you know, since Miller himself. I really believe that. Um, I just think it's uh, you know, I've never, ever, and I've told Tom this, but I've never, ever believed um, anyone that Batman has loved anyone in terms of a female love interest. I never believed he loved Vicki Vale. I never believed he loved anybody. Silver State um, even when Even when he was supposed to love Selena, I never believed he loved her. And even in, and I've hinted about the Diana stuff, and that's all fun, but I believe the love that you know, Bruce has for Selena or that the bat has for the cat. I believe it. I believe it to my core. He like earned it. He took him 50 issues, but he earned that love. Um, and that's a friggin'. I love that. All we're talking about is like the love of these characters, right? Not the battle or who they fought and, you know, yep. we can get lost in that easy, but he made me believe what I haven't believed for 30 years of my life. Um, you know, cause to me, Batman loves only one thing and that's the war on crime. That's all he's capable of. Him. And Dick Grayson and the Robins, I'll give him space for that because they are him and it's a love of self fine. And you love your parents, but that, you know, beyond your family to get out of your family, I, I was like, not capable. Can't happen. I don't believe it. It's all, you know, it's just a further plot, you know, silver saying cloud. I don't believe it. I don't care. Okay. <laughs> but m man, I believe this one. I agree with you. And I, and much like yourself, taking over Green Arrow, you know, Tom's following Scott Snyder and, and very comfortable at Marvel and doing great stuff at Marvel. And I know it was a bidding war uh, between the publishers, and he had a really tough choice to make. And he took the riskier road as well because, hell, it's, it's fucking Batman. And I, and I couldn't blame him, but I'm like, all right. I mean, we, he and I even talked about it, and I'm like, 
you know, whatever, whatever makes you happy, man. And like you said, he he hit the ground running and that great reveal. And yes, people were disappointed that we didn't get a wedding. We'll see. It's only half the story is only halfway done. But that incredible reveal that it's Bane's plot all along. And the people yeah, that he has I, I didn't involved even care. Like that's the thing. The thing that's so great to me is like I you know, and that was fine, like that was fun and that was great. But I just love that, you know, we've seen a <laughs> we've seen a lot of com anyone who's read comics for so long has seen you know, weddings that are promised and don't happen. It is like the, it is a trope of all tropes in sure. the sense just that it's been done a lot. I was literally heartbroken. I was like, oh man, even though, even though oh, you yeah. know what's coming in this slow motion car crash, it hurts. And that's when you earn it, you know, like, yes, even when you've seen it 50 times before, you're like, man, that one got me because man, he did that, that issue where, you know, they go to the, they go to the park um, you know, Clark and him and Lewis. Superman trade costumes you yes. know, with, with the double D. <laughs> that, that issue, I mean, forget the fact that, like, there's a ride called the Red Tornado as, like, a Tilt-A-Whirl, <laughs> which is inspired, right? Forget about the Wonder Twins easy jokes. Like, the emotion that's in that issue. Um, and, I, I, you know, I don't know if Tom knows this, but um, right when he was early on the book, um, Mitch, who was doing the art at that point, Gets, had yeah. this beautiful splash page. I, I don't know if it's their first kiss. I think it's Batman and Catwoman's. Like, it's one of their first kisses, and it's this double page spread. They're up on a rooftop of Goth- Gotham, and the picture is truly just the rooftops of Gotham. And in a tiny, tiny, like the size of your thumb, in the bottom <laughs> right corner are Batman and Catwoman kissing. Yep. And I looked at that page and was like, "This is friggin' breathtaking." I said, this is someone who actually is in love and knows what it's like to love someone only can write this page. And someone who loves someone can only draw this page. And I contacted Mitch and I said to him, listen, I know this is silly, but has anyone bought that page of art yet? I'd love to buy it. And he said to me, it, it doesn't exist it, because I did it digitally. It, it's oh. not real. It's all on, on the computer. And I said, well, how much would it be to make it exist? And I bought it as a, an anniversary present for my wife. And I never, in all the years we've been married, I've never bought her. I don't buy her any comic stuff. She doesn't read comics. You know, she's, she's you know, she, I made her read Watchmen before I would get married. I made her read Dark Knight before I got married. Like, there were rules, of course, like, like in Diner, you got to pass the yeah, rules. Like, there were things she had to do. But, like, but I... I never pushed that stuff on her, but I was like, this page is it. So Mitch actually painted the page for me and, and I gave it as a gift to my wife. It hangs. It's, it's the only thing in our house. One of the few things I hang up that's like from comics in our house out, you know, where people can see it. Um, and it, to me, just stands for it's love. It's yes. just true love, not a plot device, not something that's, you know, you can only write about love when, when you know, if, if you've loved before and you have to feel it. And I just felt like that's what you've done so beautifully. Agreed. No, there, these those moments between Selena and Bruce are, are true romance comic moments. And, yes, Mitch and the others that have had to do – Joelle's done a great job, obviously. And uh, Joelle he, crushed it, man. Crushes yeah. it. Love her stuff. I no, mean, I'm reading amazing. Catwoman just for her. Agreed. No, I am too. Absolutely, man. That's so funny. Yeah, immediately when you said the <laughs> testing your wife with Watchmen and uh, and Dark Knight. Yes, you're Steve Gutenberg with the uh, with the uh, Baltimore Colts uh, quiz from Diner. Absolutely, <laughs> exactly. Right. Got a fast <laughs> sports quiz. Are you a uh, now? You know, I just I, I I go down these YouTube rabbit holes and I usually text Bendis and tell him what I'm watching. And and you know, of course, he's like, seriously, man, get a life. But I, I happen to go down a local hero rabbit hole. And uh, watched a great documentary about that Bill Forsyth movie from the early '80s, Burt Lancaster, Peter Rigard. I don't know if you know that movie. No, what, what's the is that? What's the name of the movie? It's called Local Hero, and it was Peter Rigard. Not Rieger. the John. Oh no, I, I thought you meant what? What was the John Ritter superhero movie? What was that? Oh, called? Hero at Large. Sure. Hero at Large. Ah, oh, freaking love. I thought you meant Hero at Large at first. I was like, wait, you remember that movie? I thought there was like I was the only person who went to see oh, it. Oh no, uh, we, uh, let's let's switch channels because that's much more of a superhero movie. Kind of poor man's <laughs> yeah, Frank. No. Kind of poor man's Frank, Frank Capra, but in all the like really nice ways. And Ritter is charming as hell in Hero at Large. That's a great movie. No. I just love, not like, like, I just love that, you know, because at that point he was the three's company man and could do yes. the bit, right? He just was like, kind of fly to stay he'll fall down at him. He's, you know, he's a physical actor, but he just, he had, you know, he really had something you loved about him, which again is, that's the Superman X factor, is, yes. right? We love him. We love him. It's why Grant Morrison has him out on that ledge talking to that kid who's going to commit suicide. 
like you love him for his kindness and his authenticity and his sincerity. Like, and what superhero do you love for their sincerity? Right. You've got to yes. like you have that or you don't. That's it. For people who don't know what we're talking about, seven nineteen seventy nine 1979 movie, John Ritter, very young Ann Archer, who played Jack Ryan's wife in Patriot Games and Clear and Present Danger. Uh, is the is the female lead? Are you doing but, that from Are you doing that from memory, or did you look up that it was Ann Archer? No, because I'm a, a well, no, because I had a massive crush and still do on Ann Archer. And uh, yeah, you're it, like it, Noah. You're like no, you're like Noah the calculator. <laughs> you can just like recall like who the <laughs> Noah who tried to convince me to once get the IMDb app so I could do this as quickly as he could, and I was like, I have the internet. I don't need an app for IMDb. This is but, why I know and I have account. you. I call you when I need to tell to know these things. <laughs> Occasionally, I'll call Noah as well and be like, "All right, and we'll we'll nerd out for about a half hour or whatever." But uh, yeah, the uh, it's it's a great movie. He's an out of work actor. He's doing live appearances in movie theaters because a Superman esque movie about Captain Avenger is out, and he ends up like stopping a grocery robbery. And yeah, like uh, one of those corner grocery stores, which was looked like just like the corner <laughs> grocery store where I lived. And sure. is getting robbed, and he comes in and saves the day, and then the cartoon hero becomes the real hero. And I just remember thinking, like, it's going to be me. Like, this is exactly the dream. It was, you know, and I, I will never ever rewatch it because it will ruin my childhood. But my God, it was such an important part of it back then. Uh, you see, it'd be interesting. I would, I would test your childhood with that because it is. It's very Frank Capra esque because it becomes a New York story, and these uh, guys running for governor decide, hey. Let's turn this to our advantage. And it's very much meet John Doe if you know your old time movies or any kind of thing where government kind of grabs a real world thing and tries to spin it politically. And certainly in today's environment, I think it would play uh, to an. A yeah, I, well, it's an all cap plays today. Right. Sincerity is a lost art. So it all whenever you see it, it, it works. Good point. It's why I listen. I, I really think that it's why Superman is back again. You know, I don't think it's just because Brian. You know, a guy named Brian came and said, hey, I want to switch sides and come from Marvel to DC. Like, I think the universe needs those things. I think great stories come from needs. And I think that he felt that personal need. He felt the world needed it. That's why it's a story he wants to tell is because we need that story right now. We need Superman more than ever right now. Um, and I think it's, you know, the universe's great humorous way of taking the kid from Cleveland where he started and bring him another kid from Cleveland in to tell a story and bring them up to the modern day. I just think that's the, that's the beauty of the universe at work right there. So, yeah. All right. Now building on, obviously you're reading uh, Brian's run. What else are you reading these days? What am I reading? You know, I almost want to like pull, um, <laughs> try and, I'm trying know, to think I I so off too. the top of my head. Yeah, no, no, pull me out. Um, listen, I like, uh, Mark Miller's, I like magic order. I think it's, you know, I think it's Agreed. really hard to launch new characters. I think it's a, be- he's done a beautiful job with that book. Um, I want, of course, at all times more Jason Aaron, Southern Bastard. I, you know, I love right. his the wrap up on Thor and the relaunch. That's been fun. Um, I just, I love. I, I tend to like the things, especially that I know I can't do. Like when he writes Thor, he finds that like I was never a fan of Thor when I was growing up because he spoke in that like ye old royal we <laughs> thing that just made no sense to me. I was like, no one talks like that. It's not funny. And and even when they launched him in in his own movie, I was like. The only thing I liked about the first Thor movie is that one moment where he takes his he's drinking coffee and he smashes the cup and he's like, more mead. And he like, you know, it's, and he doesn't realize like you're not supposed to act like that in, in a coffee shop. <laughs> and God bless the Marvel guys for figuring out on the movie side like, oh, our actor's really fucking funny. And he can pull this off. And that fish out of water thing makes Thor so much more interesting when he's doing it like for comedy as well as action. Absolutely. Um, and I and I feel like Jason Aaron just has that voice that I look at. and I'm like, you found that interesting way. I can't even I, I'm trying to make a joke of it right now in the sense of like, get I can't even do that imaginary voice. Like, I, I love <laughs> it. I feel like that's how he talks when he's drunk or something. But like. Yeah, I love that book. You know, I think that that's a fun book. I, um, what else am I reading that I'm well, really you're thinking I, I want to mention on Jason's thing, I love the three ages of Thor that happened in the original run, and especially old Thor. It's just fascinating. I guess. Oh, my God. Of course. I and mean, also the three, you know, the three, what is that? I forget the daughters, granddaughters, right? The granddaughters, like, yes. That one, that, 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 uh, what was it? The, was it the God Killer? It wasn't, the, yes. that was the run yes, with the, the God, God Killer. Killer. The end of the God Killer stories where they first appear. That was just spectacular. I remember reading that and going, this is a person 
who has a full grasp of the entire mythos. Like he's yeah. got, it's not a story. Like it's easy to tell one story. It's easy to just like create a fight scene and build a beginning and ending around it. But like there are times, you know, Paul Levitz, um, I forget if it was Levitz or Shrek told me one time when I first got into comics, they were like comics, you know, most stories are three act structure. There's the beginning, the middle and the end. And what they said is that comics are forever act two. The right. character never yeah. ends. It right. just keeps going forever. It's forever act two. And it's why some stories got frustrated. Now, naturally, the natural way of things, comics needed a three act structure. It's why like contained stories took off when Dark Knight happened and Watchmen happened. And obviously there were many stories before that, but suddenly, you know, people talk about the decompression of comics and whatever they want to bullshit about to complain about because we're all becoming <laughs> old men. But the reality of it was is people just wanted a friggin' story. They yeah. wanted a full beginning, middle and end. And, and there are times when you see someone who can take what, even when you're in the middle of act two and you feel like you're just there, but says, no, you know what, jackass, I got all the acts planned out and they're all happening. And that, that moment when that happened, I was like, Oh, we're in a master class here and he's got it all taken care of. And I'm just, you know, you just sit back and, and get your popcorn ready. Cause it's going to be good. Agreed. You know, this is the thing about events though, because I understand and I agree with uh, Levitz and Shrek and, and the general feeling that when you're talking about the regular monthlies, of course, it's an ongoing story. Of course, you're stuck in act two, but I think when you do an event, you could put a bow on it and still have a, the next day and also still have those teasers of, you know, at the end of crisis. OK, now Barry, out, now uh, Wally's the flash and we're going to find right, Wally. And, that, that, and, that, and look, that's what we tried to do with, you know, we've been getting all these requests for people to do interviews for, for us to do interviews because it's the anniversary of identity crisis. It's the 10th anniversary. Um, no, 15, I think it's 15th. Oh, we my did God. The 10th anniversary. Yeah. Whoa. Get ready to be old. <laughs> um, and so people have been asking us, and I think also with Tom's, you know, with, um, with his crisis book coming out, like, you know, they, True. whatever, True. They, we, we, and God bless. Like, I think that you a hundred percent have to put the bow on it. You ha I actually disagree with the idea that it's always an act two or should be to me, the best stories that we all love in comics have the three acts, you know, and they could be yes. six acts. They could be 19 acts, whatever it is, but you you need to have the bow. I remember reading when crisis, you know, original crisis came out. It was a tiny little panel where you see Barry, you know, Barry's costume on Wally and going, yes. wait, the belt's different. This is going to be awesome. You know, yes. <laughs> and and that was amazing. Right. There was a plan there. You were like, here it comes. Because I was I remember still being pissed at Wally giving up the costume on that white Perez cover, Hilarious. Um, which was actually, you know, that cover was where we got the last issue of Identity Crisis from. It was always the homage to that. I was like, I love that old Perez white cover. Jesus. I just saw Rags at at. Uh... Terrificon in Connecticut and, and said yep. hello, and, and I'll have a future conversation with him in a couple months. And um, and also uh, Guggenheim as well. You mentioned him earlier and stuff. I had I had a great uh, – oh, and Mike Barron mentioning Wally and uh, his takeover of the Flash. Oh, gosh, you know, I so. remember that. I remember the good old chunk. I remember all that. I remember, remember knowing at the time exactly what Wally's top speed was. I think it was like 814 miles an hour or 715 <laughs> miles an hour. I remember just being like, that's the number. He will get no faster than that. They've told me so. You know, and then when he got a hair fast, you were like, he's getting a little faster. And I can't believe it. And I, I was like, because I was friggin 13. That's why I couldn't believe it. I did. I was, you know, I forget how many years older, but uh, <laughs> you know, still enjoying it as well. Man. Um, what else are we reading? I love what do I love? I love Squirrel Girl. Um, <laughs> I'm just trying to think. I like I mean, I like all of Brian's stuff. I like all of Tom's stuff. I still, you know, I still put, you know, even though it's two or three years old at this point, I still give vision to every person I can think of to give Absolutely. them. Um, we mentioned flash. I love Joshua think. Williams, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Williamson's, uh, work right now on the flash. And I'm very, yeah, no, to see what's what about I, loved, to happen. I loved, um, just out of the DC Marvel universe for a moment. I loved, um, gosh, I'm blanking on the name of it, but Xander Cannon's book, the one on the Island. Oh, uh, Ka uh, Ka Ka Kaiju uh, Max. Kaiju Max. Oh man. Do I love that book? That book is a beautiful, dark book. I love that book. Absolutely. Um, no, I agree with that. Noah just and Noah sent it to me. I, I mean, I was like, I missed all of this. And I love um, Jeff Lemire's, um, what's that kind of golden age homage? I Black, Hammer. Uh, Black, Black Hammer. Black Hammer. I yes. love Black, Black Hammer. It's a wonderful book. Uh, that book just totally undoes me. Because you, know, you read it and I'm just like, that's good stuff. Right and, here. and again, much like Jason, Jeff can do a book like Black Hammer and at the same time, 
do Gideon Falls, which is this intense thriller that he's doing with uh, uh, Sorrentino. And I'm forgetting it. Yeah, no, I know. I love that. And, and or reading, um, what was that oversized kind of like giant book? Um, I'm always forgetting oh, AD. the names of everything. Now. AD was Yeah, AD, at the After Death book. Yeah, that was a fun book too, like a mix of prose and everything else. But, you know, you didn't know where it was going. You're like, is this going to be worth it? And then it totally stuck the landing, which, you know, I was like, okay, this is the thing I like about this. Um, and I love, you know what, going back just for a moment is um, I think that Jeff, uh, doing the the kind of you never thought that a Watchmen sequel is ever going to work. You know how do you go near that? And Agreed. Um, but Doomsday Doomsday Clock is is he's writing the crap out of that book. I just think you know especially that marionette character and the Mon character are just again I think new characters in our universe of where we know everything and know everyone uh, are really hard to do. No, I'm really in, hard. Yeah, I'm enjoying um, Doomsday Clock as well. That. Yeah, no, it's a it's a great story. Gary Frank. You know, tremendous artist. I mean, Gary Frank can can do no wrong in my eye. He's like, it, someone asked me like recently what artists, because I've basically worked with, you know, Jim and I, uh, Lee and I, are, we always talk about, uh, we definitely want to do something a little longer. We did a page together for Justice League, but wanted to do something longer. But, you know, the people that I really would kill to Gary is on the top five of people I would still love to work with. Sure. Absolutely. I love that you two uh, worked in, in your C-SPAN interview, uh, a great story about Gene Ha. And and that how artists look at oh yeah I forgot that was in that interview yeah you want me to tell it here yeah well, please no absolutely man no, so, you know. yeah no <laughs> Jim gave me I mean Gene gave me this amazing detail that I just was I, I forgot I had put in the new novel um, we had just finished working on um, this Justice League story with Red Arrow and Vixen buried under all this rubble in issue number eleven and it was the one that got nominated for the Eisner we got to win it was an incredible experience we got to share. And uh, Gene came down to Florida for, I forget, some con. We went out to dinner and we're sitting there for a couple of hours just kind of talking comics and everything else. And at the end of the meal, he's like, I'm so glad I got to finally see you because now I know so much more about you. And I'm like, but we've been working together. And like, what, you know, I don't remember. We, didn't, we weren't like you know, bearing our souls. We were just talking about like books we like to read. <laughs> and he rattles off like 10 different things, like little visual and ticks that I do that I don't even realize they do. And I'm not talking about the obvious ones, but ones that I'm just like, Oh my gosh. And I realized in that moment that as an artist, he sees the world differently than the rest of us see the world. <laughs> and, you know, chip kid, my friend, you know, who's a graphic designer. Yes, indeed. Like we, we, we see a red stop sign. Chip kid sees one of the great representations of graphic design ever created. He sees the world differently than the rest of us. So when I was developing this character, Nola, who's a, an, a war artist, one of the, the U.S. Army has had since uh, World War One, and this is true, an actual artist on staff, a painter, who paints disasters as they happen, whether it's the beaches of Normandy, Vietnam, 9-11, there's a painter on staff. And I realized that that's NOLA. And I've worked with all these artists in comics, but I never realized what they're, how, they're, how differently they see the world. So NOLA sees how you, which way the pin is pace, facing on your belt. She knows which way your belt buckle goes, so she knows if you're right or left-handed based on which way you pull it. Nola sees that when you walk past a reflective surface, you always check yourself because you're vain. Nola sees you have crow's feet on only one of your eyes because you're a hunter, and that's the eye you hunt with. Nola sees your weaknesses, and she finds them instantly. And it was Gene Ha, the artist, who kind of brought it out and showed it to me. So I, I owe comics for that one, too. Nola, the protagonist and the escape artist for people. Uh, who, yeah, who so don't she be, yeah, who you're talking about. The, so, yeah, absolutely. That. Yeah, no, so she became she became my new main character who I'm writing. Uh, I wrote The Escape Artist and now writing again. That's excellent, man. Yeah, that's right. I forgot that you've got a follow-up coming to The Escape Artist as well. So people have to jump on it, man. Paperback coming out uh, the week of – I'm doing my math – the week of the 10th because we're speaking the week yeah, of the Yeah, something third. like that. I forget so, where it is, yeah. No worries. That's awesome, man. Do you have to run? I don't want to keep you if you got to go. Yeah, I, gotta, I, I, I have to run in like probably three minutes. Okay. I uh, what else? What else have I got? Well, you for tell you? me, Math, you Matthew tell Rosenberg. Me I'm loving Multiple Man. I think that's a tremendous book, and I have. Oh, to I haven't Matthew read that on. book. I'll check it out. Tell me what else I should be reading. Yeah. What What am I missing? Um. Oh God. Now you see. Now you got me uh, thinking. Now. Um. God. What else am I buying? Oh God. Uh, hey kids, comics. Howard Chaykin's history of comic books. I uh, yeah. I'm excited for that. I haven't. Is that out yet? I know it's yes. on my pull list, but I haven't been to the comic store since I got back. I, First I, two you know, issues. It's funny because DC. Um, 
that has me on their comp list. So I obviously don't have to go to the comic store for that. And so I only go to the comic store now, like every month and a half and I just get the stack and then blow through it. Um, so what used to be the, you know, every Friday and then when it became every Wednesday and you know, every whatever, I, I <laughs> have been spoiled enough by the bastards at DC to, to make my habit shrink. Have you, I don't know if they've traded it yet, but how uh, mentioning Howard as well. And I talked to him about this, uh, his rough and ready. Uh, the, the Hanna no, Barbera. I've not read that. It, it's fantastic, man. It's a it's a great parody of where media is. And imagine Rough and Ready as like a Martin and Lewis comedy duo of the fifties, because they were. And if they tried to come back in today's world and get back together, and just all the media hoops they have to jump through, talk shows and uh, that, with my, yeah, media. that reminds me of a. I don't know if you ever read the book where the truth lies. It's kind of like has a similar vein. I love that old book. It was, was that a fictionalized um, Martin and Lewis thing? It was a, it was, it was like a fictionalized version of it. Exactly. And they were, it was a very, very similar, but one of them, there's a murder that happens. Just add a murder and you get the same thing. But oh, wow. it was just one of those, it was probably like 20 years ago, but it was just one of those great books. And I, you know what I also love just because you're on Hanna Barbera, I love that all the kind of, um, the Hong Kong fooies and the crossovers yes. and the Elmer Fudds. And I love that they're all working. Agreed. I love that we live in a universe where they're just like, okay, nerds, you love this shit when you were five years old. You're all in your middle age now. <laughs> Do your worst. Give us the best version of it. And we're all like, man, that's going to suck. And then we're like, that's awesome. But I love that I'm opening up my thing. My kid is like, who's Snagglepuss? I'm like, just <laughs> come on. Let's just go. Just go with it. Agreed. And I just read Gail's uh, Tweety, Sylvester, and Catwoman. I can't that was wait. Terrific. Yeah, no, I'm excited for Gail. I saw that she was doing that. I got yeah, I have to get that. Absolutely. And also, now you mentioned uh, Murders, uh, The Con Artist, a great new novel that Fred Van Lenty wrote. Uh, is, is a oh, I haven't book. read that. I like Fred. Yeah, no, I want to read that. Wait, right. it's, an, it's an actual novel? Yeah, it's, a, it's his second. He did ten, 10 Dead Comedians was his first one and about the comedy world, and now he's done The Con Artist, and they're both great. And shame on me. I don't have it in front of me. But uh, you got to do – well, you have to do Charles Oracle here if you're going to plug – Comic oh, yes. book writers doing novels, oh, yeah. and, that's and, a good book, too. And, that's and, a yeah, great book. Charles, yes, Charles has been on Word Balloon talking about Oracle Year when it came out. I, I absolutely agree with that. Paul Kupperberg wrote a 50s comic industry mystery, and I don't have it in front of me, so I don't have the title. But, you know, Paul, a wonderful art, a writer from uh, an editor yep, from the Bronze sure. Age. And, and that's great. And then also I'm looking at a book. It's, uh, it's more of a coffee table book, but it's uh, The Justice League's 100 Greatest Moments by uh robert greenberg and um oh like bob greenberg just showed up my signing two days ago in line i, and saw I the love photo. when it's like you know it was great yeah i didn't realize it so he did a, a justice league 100 greatest moments through history yeah i gotta relook and see uh see if any of your uh, justice league moments are in there my man no no because that's all any of us care about is, is my crap in there right <laughs> like that's the moment like it's a perfect place to end right like that the whole thing is you know continuity is this wonderful beautiful tapestry okay. right and I remember when I first started, um, they said to me, Paul Lovitz explained to me that there were three types of continuity. And he said that there's the continuity that will never be changed, right? Is Superman came from Krypton, came down to the planet Earth, met the Kents, you know, Batman's parents shot dead in an alley. It just never changes, locked right. in stone. He's like, and then you have like the the stories that are, you know, you kind of think of as continuity and people remember them and, you know, you try and bring them in there. But you know what? If you have to change it, you change it. He's like, and then there's just bad stories <laughs> and you just don't like them. Right. You just you just see so you kind of apologize for me. You just want to get rid of them because that that really screwed everyone shit up. Like when they did that one. And it's obviously a complete slippery slope. It's completely ridiculous. And everyone's like, you know, we can all cry and wring our hands and say, no, that's not how it should be. You got to make it work. But at the end of the day, the only continuity that I think any comic book person cares about is their own crap. Like, <laughs> is my stuff working, right? And I remember that I never even considered it. I never cared about it. I never even thought about it because you were just so happy to bring in comics. But right when I first started, um, my, my, my dream book, the one that, I, you know, every year on my birthday, I always um, email Dan DiDio and Joe Casada and ask them to let me do Justice League Avengers. Um, for like wow. over a decade now, like every year. Um, and when they did JLA Avengers, I remember it was right after I'd done work on Green Arrow. I don't know if Justice League had started yet. And there's this one page that only Perez could draw where it's like the shattering of some crystal. And you can see in the crystal all the moments of every hero 
like, and Perez just drew like a jillion panels, right? It's like every, like there's Batman backbreaking and there's Superman dying. And that like every hero has their moment in there. And I remember in one of those tiny little shattered crystals is one of my green arrow moments. And it was the first time I'm reading JLA Avengers, my dream book. Like Judd and I used to write it in college. We would, I can literally like, in, in I sleep, I think about that book. And there in it was like one tiny sliver of one of my issues. And it was the greatest friggin' reward. And it was one of those, like, I know it's so silly and so egotistical and so narcissistic to say it, but my God, it was one of the most rewarding things of it is just to know that on that tapestry, you had a little tiny little space that, you know, maybe no one else noticed and only I noticed because I took out my microscope to check it. But man, it was there and we existed. Hey, man, you're in the club. You made it into the club. Absolutely. I get that. And and I think any longtime comic book fan can appreciate that. Saturday Night Live fans can appreciate that. That's like the five timer, the five host timers uh, club. That, yeah, you know. one, two, three, four, five, of course. <laughs> no, I get it, man. Your uh, your contributions to the comics community are always welcome, Brad. You know that. And uh, as always, continued success. Uh, so happy for you and Chris with these I Am books. I am Neil Armstrong out now. I am Soto, Simo, uh, Soto Sotomayor. Sonia Soto, Sotomayor. It's like trying to say Boutros, Boutros, golly. Uh, yeah, yeah. Sonia Soto, Sotomayor. <laughs> but that's out. Justice Sotomayor's book is uh, out in November. And uh, who'd you say in January? Uh, in January is the first conspiracy in February is Billie Jean King. There you go. Yes, indeed. And yeah, man, the Washington conspiracy book. That's amazing. Good Lord. That now finally Robert De Niro can play, uh, George Washington. You want to go after me? Does De Niro want to, does he want to, yeah, no, I was going to say, unless you know something, I don't know. No, I think that's a, that's a good fellow's moment. That's a, that's yeah, a... no, that is the moment you're talking to me. He's a <laughs> taxi driver. It is. So, dude, always a pleasure. Congratulations, and uh, thank you, brother. Uh, let's talk next year, and we'll uh, we'll do it again. Can't wait. Okay, a couple post-interview comments. Um, the likely Supreme Court nomination hearing that Brad was at, if it was the one after Robert Bork, it might have actually been Justice Kennedy, the man who was stepping down to make room for Brett Kavanaugh. Uh, the new Supreme Court justice nominee and likely next justice for the Supreme Court. I thought that was interesting to uh, say that. And again, I, I, I got to hunt down on C-SPAN and see Brad in his T-shirt behind Joe Biden in that confirmation. Brad Meltzer, of course, The Escape Artist, comes out in paperback uh, this coming Tuesday. And then I Am Neil Armstrong is already out. And the other IN books that are coming out uh, late in this year and early next year, Great stuff from Brad Meltzer. Can't wait for our next conversation. And Ted Anderson, everybody. Moth and Whisper from Aftershock Comics. Check it out. Hope you enjoyed today's Word Balloon. Again, it was brought to you by our friends at Aftershock Comics. Shaking things up at your local comic shop right now with series like Animosity by Marguerite Bennett and Raphael De La Tour, Baby Teeth with Donny Cates and Gary Brown, and interesting FBI supernatural story, A Walk Through Hell from Garth Ennis and Goran Suzuka. Other exciting new titles as well, like Hot Lunch Special, Elliot Real, and Jorge Fornes. Beyonders from Paul Jenkinson, Wesley St. Clair. Check out what's rumbling at AfterShotComics.com. And of course, Word Balloon brought to you by the League of Word Balloon listeners. Thank you very much, League, for your support via Patreon. Uh, you are helping me out, and I truly appreciate it. If you want to help the cause, go to WordBalloon.com and uh, click on the Patreon page there. Or you can go to patreon.com slash word balloon. Thank you again, League of Word Balloon listeners. Okay, thanks for listening. We're back early next week with a brand new word balloon. Likely going to be back to Word Balloon 101. And expect some incredible conversations about Marvel Cosmic with Roy Thomas, Jim Starlin, Ron Lim, and Joe Rubenstein. Two amazing panels from Terrificon just last month. Happy to share them with you. Until then, Word Balloon is a copyright feature of Shaky Productions, copyright 2018.